good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the uh, City of Rancho Mirage uh, City Council meeting, uh, which includes the Library Board, the Housing Authority Board, and the City Council representing the Redevelopment Successor Agency special meeting to today, Tuesday, September 23rd, 2014, and it is 1 o'clock. So we will begin with uh, Bruce Carey, who will lead us in the flag salute. Cindy, would you like to call roll next? Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Hobart? Here. Council Member Kite? Here. Council Member Townsend? Here. Council Member Weil? Here. And Mayor Smartrich? Here. Thank you. And moving on to our presentations. And we have first on our list uh, an update and report on the Palm Springs Unified School District by board member Sherry Stewart. And she'll be coming down to our podium here and uh, give us a few words. Right here is perfect. Just pull the microphone towards you. And Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> you all look very official. <laughs> Officious. Officious. It's, it's, I just want to tell you it's a pleasure to come here today on behalf of the Palm Springs Unified School District and give you a little update. I want to thank you for the relationship that you have with our school district and that we have with you. And I appreciate your, you're always willing to listen and come out and root for our teams. So I know usually we go around and give these re reports, they're usually around 20 minutes. And I know I was told to keep it to around five. So I'm going to do my best, OK? okay. I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview about the school district, even though some of you might know a lot of the information I'm going to tell you. And then I'm going to focus on Rancho Mirage High School, because there's a lot of exciting things to tell you about Rancho Mirage High School. Our school district is comprised of 28 K-12 schools. We represent Cathedral City, Palm Springs, Rancho Mirage, and Thousand Palms. We have over 23,000 students that on any given day are trying to get to school at a certain time and get home from school. So sometimes it causes some traffic around the schools, but thank you very much for your help in alleviating the traffic around our schools. Um, we have over 1,100 teachers and we have 1,000 classified employees. So we are the largest employer in the West Valley. Uh, we, at about eight years ago, we passed a $516 million bond. This allows us to build new schools, purchase land to build future schools, and also renovate our schools. And I'm sure when you drive by our schools, you'll see that all of our schools are in top condition, and they help the environment. Um, we installed solar on uh, 14 of our district sites. And a lot of people thought that we were doing this because we wanted to give shade to people parking in our parking lots. But obviously, that was just one of the side benefits that um, the solar gave. The district will pay lower annual utility rates. For the next 20 years, our rates will not be raised at all. And we'll save an estimated eight to $10 million because of the solar that we installed. And the district doesn't pay for this solar equipment, only for the energy that is produced. Now we've had, I'm sure all of you know that over the past five years, there have been many serious cuts to education. And we, our district was very, very conservative and we managed to get through this crisis. And we did not have to lay off any teachers, we didn't have to have furlough days, and we kept most of our programs. And this was being through our ability to be so conservative and also proactive. Now, funding is improving, believe it or not. And the current projections 
for Palm Springs Unified School District with the local control funding formula is that we will have an increase in $87 million over the next six years. So it's going to be really important for the school district to manage this money because we do not want to spend now, obviously, and not have any for the future. So we're working very hard in how to give back things that we had to cut with the serious crisis that we had. Now, I'm sure that you're aware that our school, our high schools have comprehensive um, pathway programs and career academies. Each of our high schools has two of these. And the Rancho Mirage High School has the Performing Arts Academy, which houses the Galen Theater. And we also have a culinary arts pathway that I'm sure many of you have visited in the past. Um, I'm going to focus a little bit now on Rancho Mirage High School. Ken wrote me this, in fact. You, know, you all know Ken Wagner. He sent it to me this morning. He says, please, could you please update the council? And I know he came here on his own and updated you in previous meetings. So year two at Rancho Mirage High School has begun and it's off to an extremely busy start. We, this is Ken when he says we, but I'm gonna say the, the school district. Uh, at Rancho Mirage High School, the school district has provided technology 1,200 Chromebooks. So each of the students that attend Rancho Mirage High School has their own computer and they are able to take it home with them. We call this 24-7 technology where the kids could be on their own computer 24 hours a day, seven days a week if they, if they choose. Um, nearly every teacher also has, all of the teachers do have computers and nearly every teacher at Rancho Maras High School operates a course website and they use computers in their classroom continuously. Now, the Rancho Mirage Culinary Arts Pathway has doubled its staff and student training courses and now has 250 students in the hospitality and kitchen field. So you can see we're training our future residents. All of our schools, when they graduate the high school, we would hope that our students are career or college ready. We understand that all of our students are not going to go to college, and it's important for them to know what career they want to go in and have a little experience working in that career at our high schools. And ultimately, we do hope that all of our students would go to college, so we want them to be prepared. One last thing, I wanted just to mention Common Core. I'm sure a lot of you hear it's a new buzzword, what Common Core is. And that since um, 2010, 45 of the United States have adopted similar core standards, curriculum. So if you go to any school, each in any grade, all of the students should be learning the same thing. So you could move from school to school, you, you could move from state to state, and hopefully your student would be at the same level throughout the Common Core curriculum. I'm gonna stop, I could go on forever, but I know you have a, a large agenda, and I don't want to overstep my time. So if, does anybody have any questions or comments? No? no, other than the fact, Sherry, we're very proud of the school district. And uh, obviously, the high school is a shiny light for our community. And we thank you for all your effort. OK, well, thank you for your support and your <laughs> understanding. And we thank Sherry so much also for appearing. And, and just to let everyone know, we are also thrilled that Sherry uh, is a member of our Rancho Mirage community. So it's, that, that's good, too. Anyway, uh, moving on to uh, non-agenda public comments. Uh, do we have any? OK. OK. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, Non-agenda public comments is an opportunity for the public to speak on issues that are not on the agenda for a maximum of three minutes per speaker. So I will call up the, we have three speakers so far listed. One is Dottie Wilder, or Wilder. She's from Rancho Mirage, and come on down to our podium. Good afternoon, Mayor Good afternoon. and Council Members. 
Um, I'm here to ask about the survey that um, the city has done for the rents in, in Las Colinas. And um, timeline for, um, for giving the um, people affordable rates, 30% of their income, and, um, uh, and the utility credit that they're supposed to be getting. Because every month that goes by, the people that are low income are charged more than they, uh, the agreement says. Um, there's several people from Las Colinas um, here today so that are concerned about the issue. Um, and uh, let's, when I was asked to leave my apartment, I was told by the city that I could only stay an additional two weeks because there was someone moving in. The owner said someone was moving in my apartment. There's still no one living in my apartment, so uh, he lied to the city, as he does to the renters. Um, uh, also, there's nothing identifying Las Colinas as low income other than the city's website. When you drive into the complex, the only sign you see says luxury apartments. So I don't know how luxury apartments equate to low income or how anyone would know that they're going into a low, low income to apply. And uh, um, I think it's, um, it should be run the way it was funded to run. And uh, a lot of people would be very happy to see it done that way. So thank you for listening and um, I'll let the thank other you. people speak. Thank you so much. Thank you. And now I will call on Kathleen Cruz. Madam Mayor. Yes. Can uh, we be brought up to date as to what the current status of the study is at Las Colinas? Yes. And we're going to do that, but uh, we have three speakers, so uh, we thought we'd let the other two speakers uh, uh, speak first, and then we will have uh, people up here address their issues. So the next one would be Kathleen Cruz. Good afternoon, I'm Kathleen Cruz. I'm a former tenant of the uh, Las Colinas um, apartment building. And uh, I, when I moved in, I was not of low income, just moved in with the idea of paying a decent rent. One of my major complaints about Las Colinas, several, and I know that you have already been addressing much of it, but I'm just going to add the manager there named um, Pat Stamper is very unprofessional and rude behavior ever since the beginning. And she harasses and intimidates many of us and watching every car and just giving you horrible looks and comments rather than coming to you personally. She serves three day notices when she wants to tell you she feels like you're not doing the right thing or you're going against your um, lease. So um, I was intimidated a lot while I was there. I had had knee surgery and had to have some family come to help me out while I was recuperating. And she harassed everyone that came. To, uh, my daughter had a dog. She came and told us we had to get rid of him. We got rid of the dog and the dog was killed the next day by a car at a friend's house. And it, it was very frustrating and sad how we were treated. Um, when I was ready um, to move, uh, before I moved, I was considering moving because I was going into retirement and I would be in a lower income. So I said, uh, would you consider my uh, fact that I'm in a lower income in retirement to subsidize my uh, rent? She says, oh, we don't do that here. So I knew of some people that were in the lower income and she said, oh, there's only a few and we, they never move. So she just bluffed it off for me right away. So I was already on the list for Whispering Waters and a couple other places here, and luckily I did get to move into Whispering Waters. However, I did want to coordinate with the others with the terrible charges. When I moved out, she charged me $1,700 because I told her that there was a stain on the carpet I was willing to pay for, 
Then she listed all kinds of things that were just unbelievable. Ms. Cruz, if you could just kind of start to wind it up a little bit. Yes, we're reaching I will. the end of the three minutes. I ended up settling in court, but I, I just want to add to the problems of the Las Colinas management and um, the way they're running it. Thank you. Thank you so much for your Thank input. Thank you for your attention. Okay. The next speaker will be Vonda Ray Scott. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council yeah. members. <clears throat> I'm, a, I'm a resident of uh, Las Colinas, and I'm speaking for Carol Slagle and Carol. Can you speak into the I'm microphone if you're going to be? I'm speaking for Carol Slagle and for Carol Schiffler and myself today. We have all been abused, bullied, harassed, intimidated, and threatened by Pat Stanton. Uh, Carol Slager, Slagle. A bathroom overflowed on a Friday afternoon after the uh, handyman had gone home. She called Pat, and Pat said, you have to wait. She uh, then went down to her neighbor. Oh, she went to the neighbor's, Carol Schiffler's, and called her again and said, I'm going to call a plumber. She said, no, you wait until Daryl comes back on Monday. <clears throat> this has happened three times. She told her to go outside to the bathrooms, so for two days, she had to go to the outside bathrooms or to the rec room, which is a half a block away from our, our building. <clears throat> and so uh, now she's in a position where it has never really been fixed, only snakes, and it's going to run over more. I mean, it, it starts to run over. Now Daryl, uh, the handyman, brought her a plunger to do it herself. <clears throat> she's 79. <clears throat> she's sick. And this plunger is really too hard for her. So this is how she's living. <clears throat> Carol's, Carol uh, Schiffler <clears throat> was given a, a new addendum. Pat has added one addendum after the other to our lease. And this one is to get Carol Schiffler's son, Michael Azarella, to uh, sign and subsidize for Carol's rent. He is not on her lease. She's been uh, there over four years and always paid on time. She also backdated, I have copies of this, she backdated it to April 1st, 2012. This is 2014, and this was given about a month ago. Could you Myself, kind of start winding it okay. up also? Myself, I'm living without a stove. It was gonna blow up, and it's, there's too lengthy, there's too many things to address right now in three minutes. But I'm living without a stove, I'm cooking on a hot plate, and uh, another lady is without an oven, it's, there's no way, rest, there's no peace. She's at us like this. She has charged me like this, threatening me. I'm sorry, but she should not be there. Thank you. Thank you so much for your input. Okay, as long as that's the uh, end of the three people that we had submitted yellow papers. If there's anyone else in the audience that would like to speak that did not submit a yellow card, Okay, seeing none, maybe we could move on to the uh, comments from Steve and from Randy. Sure, Madam Mayor, the apartment complex is not owned by the city. It's not one of the city's affordable housing projects. I do know the apartment owner, Michael Kiner, and I will call him after, as soon as this meeting's over to talk to him about uh, the behavior of the manager at the complex. We've had similar situation with our code compliance officer, so I understand that firsthand. And um, we have your information here. Once I talk to him and we can get this squared away, I'll give you a call back and let you know the status. Uh, in the meanwhile, I would like Sean Smith or uh, Steve Quintanilla to talk about the rent levels, as Dottie had brought up, uh, the first speaker, and, uh, and have him address whether or not the rents being charged are in compliance with the city's operating agreement with the developer. I'll go ahead and start, and then um, Sean has a something to show on the screen overhead. Um, we, did, we did have a meeting with Ms. Wilder when she first came to us with her um, concerns about being evicted, um, and we did learn that there she was evicted. Um, Mr. Binder was able to contact Mr. Kinder, the property owner, and convince him to provide her with an additional two weeks, which she declined. Um, I understand that Ms. Wilder also took her case to the Fair Housing Council, Riverside County, and I have not heard from them. 
Um, I, you know, last I heard, it was we're, there's still a decision pending, um, but I don't know how far they'll go with this now that it, she's out of the um, complex. But the city does, the housing authority has an agreement with the current owner, and that agreement is called an owner's participation agreement. And we're obligated under the law to enter an, into an agreement with any property owner that receives any assistance, financial assistance from the city for affordable housing. And so we have such an agreement in place. It's been in place for quite a while. And so our, under, our obligation under the law is to monitor and enforce the affordability restrictions that are imposed on that particular complex. And those affordability um, provisions have been set forth in the agreement since day one, and we just recently conducted a survey or an audit to determine whether or not they are in compliance. And so um, I would ask now that Sean, our, our housing manager, come forward and just kind of give us, go over the results of that survey. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council. Um, Sean Smith, Economic Development and Housing Manager for the City of Rancho Mirage. Um, as Mr. Quintanilla pointed out, we did conduct a survey in compliance with our owner participation agreement late summer. We received, received the results of that survey, which are posted on the PowerPoint presentation slide above on the screen. The monthly maximum rent levels that are shown on that slide are the ones that are dictated um, by virtue of the median income thresholds for the County of Riverside and established for, for this location. What we found essentially is that the project is in compliance within those income thresholds. Um, there are two units that should be in the very low category that exceed those maximum thresholds, but all of the other 82 units are within the income thresholds established. So for us at this point in time, um, while there are a couple of outstanding questions that remain um, in, in need of answering, from our standpoint, based on the information we received from a survey sent directly to the residents of the, the project, the project is in compliance. Thank you very much, Sean. Any questions from council members? Sean, when um, we've met on this item several times, and there seems to be a question as to what the rent should be from the people who are there, are you saying that the survey now indicates that everybody is at the correct rent and also do they, uh, one of the uh, ladies mentioned uh, rebates for health care or a prescription rebate. Are they entitled to such a rebate? No, it's my understanding there would be no prescription or health care rebates. There is um, a portion of the agreement which calls for utility allowance and that's one of the outstanding questions. If we look at just the rents that were reported on the surveys, those all fall within the thresholds established. So those are all in compliance. We do need to take a look at the utility allowances because we're not quite certain that the ones that they're providing to the tenants are the ones that we've identified in our agreement. And there's um, a current coordination occurring between Steve's office and myself to answer that question. So I don't have the answer relative to the allowances at this point. Have, have we gone back to the various tenants and let them know what their rent should be and what they're paying? Well, at this point, all of the rents that were reported are, are within the permissible uh, amounts. Well, we have, so there would be none. We have six people here today who are all saying that they're not paying the correct amount. We sent the survey to individual residents, and those individual residents, what they sent back to us is what we're reporting in the survey results. In addition to the ones that did... Maybe we should sit down with each one of them individually and let them know what their rent should be and what they're paying so they have a clear understanding of that. That may be problematic to some degree because they don't follow the same formula for indicating the rent as we do for our housing authority projects. All that we're responsible for is making sure that their rent levels are within the permissible thresholds. And based on the information we receive, they all are within those thresholds. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm not questioning that. I would just think it would be helpful if we were able to sit down with each one of them and clarify the, the current rent that they're paying. Any of them that have a question outstanding, I'd be happy to do that with. Okay, good, thank you. Sure. I sh should also point out that um, during the survey, it was discovered that some of the renters actually have incomes that are higher than they should be. Um, that's correct, and that's one of the other issues. However, there's a clause in the agreement and in the CCNRs 
that indicates that any unit that's been available for 30 days or more may be rented out to somebody that does not qualify under those income thresholds. And those may, that may be the reason for that. Those same people, though, are still paying rent within the low affordable income thresholds. So they're not being charged more. And I, uh, if I may suggest that. Uh, I would think it's a good idea if you and Richard meet with these ladies, sit down, hear what they have to say and how they present it, and do the best we can to all get on the same page. Because when you're talking, heads are shaking no. So I think we can solve the problem. And Richard and you have been dealing with it, and I think it's an important issue. Uh, I would certainly suggest you try to put together a meeting as quickly as possible. And we can do that with any additional residents that may have a question as well. Right, anybody sure. else, sure. And I would suggest, too, that we provide the residents with information about the Fair Housing Council, Riverside County. Um, that is a nonprofit organization that contracts with the county and provides services to residents throughout Riverside County. And they provide services in connection with anti-discrimination claims, any landlord-tenant disputes, and even one-on-one -on -one counseling. And they're able to provide you with information about your rights as a tenant. Um, with respect to our jurisdiction, our jurisdiction is limited to the rent amounts. Um, the, they have an office in Palm Springs. The phone number is 760-864-1541. That's 864-1541. Or you can call uh, an 800 number at 655-1541. That's 655-1541, in case anybody out there is watching. And they will meet with you only by appointment Monday through Thursday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. But if anybody has any concerns about anything that has to do with your landlord, I encourage you to contact them first. Okay. Thank you, Sean. Thank you so much, Sean. Thank you. Randy, right, so um, it may also be useful, uh, since there were several comments about the property manager, yes. that we sit down and discuss that with the property owner. Yes. and try and uh, resolve those issues. Absolutely, Councilman. I'll, I'll call him this afternoon, especially on the toilet and the uh, stove issues. Well, Certainly. That's something that we can all, you can all talk about with Richard and with Sean and the committee of people that you want to bring to this meeting and discuss all the issues that are, are very troubling to you. Okay. All right. I believe council the uh, public comments are closed for now, so we will be moving on to uh, city council board member comments. And anyone would like to go? I would. I'd be glad to go. Okay. <coughs> I want to introduce people to Nate. JJ, it's nice to see you again and have you back here. Uh, I know you've been working hard. While I'm showing people Nate, why don't you tell people about how Nate can be uh, rescued, adopted, and other uh, dogs uh, that your group is taking care of and have available for the public. Like Nate, many of our dogs are rescued from the shelters. Ah. <laughs> uh, they come from the streets. Uh, wherever they're want wanted, we want them, and we... Uh, Give them the best veterinary care we can, the best care, the best love. They stay in foster homes. Um, Nate was in the shelter. He uh, was going to be euthanized for this behavior. Uh, they considered him non-adoptable. He's a wonderful puppy. He's about seven months old. He's neutered, microchipped, fully vaccinated, dewormed, and uh, we actually go over and we do the coronavirus vaccination now. Um, you can... Uh, Visit us online at banditsresort.org. You can also call us at 760-285-9532. 760-285-9532. Uh, he is still very much a puppy. He would do best in maybe uh, a home where the you're active, run, um, maybe a little bit of obedience training. He's more on the lab side, which is the playfulness. Um, he's just a wonderful dog. He's been with us for several months, and we're still trying to find him a home. I wanted to uh, hold Nate so that people could see. I mean, he is obviously a larger dog than we usually have. I just wanted to demonstrate that Nate 
is another one of the dogs that will put a lot of loving into your life. And uh, if you're a little bit stronger than, uh, uh, than what's necessary for the smaller dogs, Nate is one great dog. And you know, all he needs is a little training, and he'll be a wonderful guy. So, JJ, thank you for bringing Nate. Keep up the good work. We appreciate everything you do. And I'd like to remind everybody that in Rancho Mirage, we pay for up to $100 toward the cost of every adoption. And um, we're going to be adding to the things that we provide if it passes this afternoon in a few minutes. Uh, I know you have to go, but uh, call me and I'll tell you about the new things that we are providing for animal uh, owners in the event it passes. So again, thank you very much, JJ. Thank you so much, JJ, and Dana. And it's a, a shame that Dana already has three loving dogs because obviously um, he, there's a great desire here to go home with Dana and, and Vicki. So uh, I don't think it's going to happen right now, but uh, whenever uh, a new dog comes up here and, and takes our hearts, uh, we all realize how important having a loving animal in our home is. And uh, if you can do it, if you can have some space and adopt a pet, uh, they are certainly a, a loving addition to your home. So thank you. Okay, moving on now, I believe Ted has something uh, for council no, comments. No, unless you want me to introduce my guest now. Sure. <clears throat> Eric Ornelas, would you want to wander down? While you're wandering down, I'll give you a flowery introduction. Uh, Eric is the communication and public affairs assistant at the Annenberg Retreat at Sunnylands. Uh, we welcome Eric, who has succeeded an icon, uh, Mary Perry, uh, who was in the position for many years. Uh, I'm sure, Eric, you'll establish your own identity that we look forward to, uh, and regular updates uh, as far as events at Sunnylands is concerned. You know, many residents are unaware that the activities at Sunnylands are available to the public. Uh, we're privileged to have this magnificent asset, and the publicity surrounding uh, the presidents and dignitaries uh, creates the impression that Sunnylands is off limits to the general public. And of course, as we know, that could not be further from the truth, uh, and you'll hear regularly as to the events that are available to the public. And Eric, we thank you for joining us and we welcome you and look forward to many other appearances. Thank you very much, Councilman Well. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mayor Smotrich, uh, Council uh, members and staff. Um, of course, uh, you're absolutely right. Sunnylands is, uh, a, is a community resource. We are here. We invite the community. And the last time we were here, uh, myself and Jeffrey Baum, our communications director at Sunnylands, was here describing our, at that time, upcoming olive harvest, very first olive harvest at Sunnylands, which is now, uh, is now officially in the books as being a, a great success. And uh, what I brought for you today is a short video to uh, show you exactly what happened at Sunnylands on that day. Hi, Eric Ornelas here for the Annenberg Retreat at Sunnylands. And today, our very first olive harvest is underway. On Saturday, September 13th, dozens of community members joined Sunnyland staff on the grounds of the historic estate to pick olives. It's a beautiful morning. You get to be on this lovely property and meet fun people. About 19 of our grounds workers volunteered on there. This is usually their day off to come yeah. in and work, yeah. um, as well as staff from all the different departments came out, so that was fun too. More than 600 olive trees were planted at Sunnylands in the 1960s, but they were never allowed to fruit until now. Today, with an eye towards environmental sustainability, Sunnylands is studying ways to harvest the olives for olive oil. So right, I don't so think we're going to have any trouble <laughs> filling the buckets. No, uh, that's great. We're walking in, you know, there were the olive trees, but then people were kind of looking around like, oh my God, you know, because there's not a lot of people who get to see this, you know. And sometimes, you know, as working here, you kind of almost like lose the sense of awe just because you're here every day, but then you see when other people come in, it's just like, it's like the first time, you know, we came in and we saw it. It, it is amazing. 
tree trimmers were on hand to cut branches off the trees and laid them onto tarps where participants could easily reach the fruit. The olives were loaded into buckets and trucked to the processing facility. We, so we, um, we heard about the olive um, festival, so we came, out, we came out here and we really enjoyed it. This first harvest was limited to a small test section of about 50 trees. Sunnylands hopes to expand the olive oil program next year. Look for Sunnylands olive oil in the gift shop this fall at Sunnylands Center and Gardens. For more information on the Sunnylands olive oil program, visit sunnylands.org. Do you think that Leonor and Walter Annenberg could ever have envisioned this use? No, but they would be thrilled. And I strongly believe they're looking down at us, so they would be ecstatic because this is more than they could have imagined. Great. Thanks, Diane. <laughs> Thank you. So as you can see, it was a, a big hit with the community, and we truly appreciate the uh, support that we've received from the city and from the community, and we hope to uh, continue events like this and many others. And of course, uh, as you know, we've been closed over the summer. Uh, and we are reopening to the public this Thursday at 9 a.m. Uh, we will be open free of charge. Sunnyland Center and Gardens will be open free of charge uh, Thursday through Sunday, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. And the tours are now back on sale. You can find tickets for those on uh, the website. I brought uh, each of you uh, uh, one of our new calendar guides for October. Uh, so that you can see what is coming up on our calendar. And our next event is uh, Films on the Great Lawn. We'll be showing uh, some uh, Alfred Hitchcock films. The uh, next one is Rear Window on October 3rd, which is a Friday at 7 p.m. And I hope to see you all there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. And Eric, did you mention when the uh, olive oil would be available? Did you happen to mention when the olive oil would be available for purchase? Sometime in the fall. We don't actually have a date yet, uh, but uh, we expect it to be in the gift shop by the holidays. Okay. I'm sure it'll be very popular. Thank you so much. Okay. Charlie, did you have any comments? Not at this time. Thank you. Okay. And Richard, you're up. Okay. All right. Well, I had a couple of comments. Mm -hmm. um, one, the first one is that regarding the mayor's message, and that goes out usually twice monthly, and most people are receiving it. But uh, since the very first bi-monthly mayor's message went out to residents on May 29th, the positive response from residents has been tremendous. The last message sent out on September 16th, 2014, was opened by 2,005 residents, which is almost unheard of. My goal with the mayor's message is to ensure that all residents of our beautiful city are made aware of all the wonderful things that Rancho Mirage has to offer. Some of my past messages have included Rancho Mirage television, which is shown on channel 17 in Rancho Mirage, the importance of CERT training and, when the, and where to sign up for classes, the Jocelyn Center and the services they provide for our 50 plus community, and finally, the Braille Institute, which, by the way, was chosen by the Parks and Re Recreation Commission as the beneficiary of this year's Art Affair grant of $2,000. I have some very exciting and inform informational ideas for up-and-coming messages, and I certainly can't wait to share them all with you. Uh, if you would like to receive the mayor's message, you can sign up by going to the homepage on the city's website at www.ranchomirage.gov. At the very bottom of that page, you will see the subscribe to section. Simply fill out your name and email address and click mayor's message box. And if, however, you need assistance with this process, please don't hesitate to call Lori LaFond or email her in the marketing department at lori at ranchamirage.gov or just give her a call at City Hall at 760-324-4511, extension 218, and she will be most delighted to help. I would just like to say also that the city's refreshed website has become a really great communication tool for Rancho Mirage. 
And in fact, since the beginning of this fiscal year, the website has been visited by over 17,000 people. And 60% of those people were new visitors. That's a lot of exposure for our city, and whether those people are coming to our website to do business or find out about where to stay, where to eat, or play in Rancho Mirage, it's putting Rancho Mirage out there for everyone to experience. So don't hesitate to jump onto our website. Uh, it's full of all kinds of interesting information, and I know you'll get a real kick out of all the, the attractive features that we offer. One last thing that I want to mention, because this is something that I've really been working hard with, it is the clo closed captioning and live meetings. And as most of you know, I am an advocate for Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, that ensures that the city of Rancho Mirage is compliant. And on that note, I am happy to report that the city of Rancho Mirage is the first city in the desert to deliver live city council meetings with closed captioning. This gives our hearing impaired residents the ability to follow city council discussions as they happen. Streaming captioning allows the hearing impaired to read the discussion in real time on compatible mobile devices. In addition, the system improves the city's communication capabilities by streaming meetings live over the internet. This means that the city council meetings can be viewed live by snowbirds from their summer homes anywhere in the world, as well as Rancho Mirage residents from their homes or offices in real time, also at www.ranchomiragega.gov slash live. This new system meets the Americans with Disabilities Act the ADA standards for accessibility for the deaf and the hard of hearing community. And a very special thanks goes out to our entire IT department who have been working diligently with CENCOR as well as US captioning as technology partners to make this all very possible. We are delighted to be taking one more step on the path to make city services and programs fully accessible to disabled residents and all others as well. In fact, I am very proud that I've been fortunate enough to have the opportunity to gather a group of people together for our first meeting, which will be held in October, which is also the official ADA recognition month. And our new task force will consist of representatives from the Braille Institute, the hearing impaired community, as well as people who have worked diligently with developmentally challenged members of our Coachella Valley at large. This is something that is very near and dear to my heart to reach out to people who are of special needs that we can do whatever possible to make their lives a little easier and bring them into our community a lot more. Thank you so much. So moving on to the approval of the minutes. Uh, may I have a motion? Move approval of the minutes for August 28th. I second it. Okay. Please vote. Mayor, my machine's not working properly. Could we try that vote again? Okay. Could everybody try your votes for me one more time? Thank you. Okay, motion passes 5-0. Thank you, moving on to the consent calendar. And Randy will be taking care of this, but I know that uh, we are going to be pulling a couple of items and Bruce Harry is going to be handling those, and they will be items number three, four, five, and six, and if there's anything else that uh, the council would like to pull or anyone in the uh, watching audience would like to pull, uh, now would be a time to let us know. Could you add number two, please? Okay, we will be pulling number two also. Okay, so Randy, will you please fill us in? 
Yes, Madam Mayor, <laughs> members of the City Council, good afternoon. So we'll pull one, two, three, four, five, six, and if we can pull number nine, okay. uh, I'll make a presentation then on um, one, seven, eight, ten, and eleven. Okay, item number one is uh, to waive full reading of all the ordinances that are introduced or adopted pursuant to today's agenda. Item number two is second reading on the Retail Center Security Ordinance, amendment to Title Eight of the Ranch Mirage Municipal Code. Item number seven is approval of final track map 34640-1 for New Age Ranch Mirage LLC, the Ritz-Carlton. Item number eight is an addendum to the Ninth Amendment to the Ritz-Carlton Hotel Development Agreement. And item number 10 is approval of contracts, and item number 11 are your demands. I'm here to answer any questions. Okay, well in the meantime, why don't we go ahead and have uh, someone um, make a motion to approve the uh, items that Randy mentioned. Move approval of items one, seven, eight, 10, and 11. Okay, do I have a second? Second. Please cast your vote. Councilmember Kite, could you press your vote? Thank you. Okay, motion carries 5-0. Thank you so much. Okay, well, why don't we go ahead, Randy, and you can tell us who's going to handle what. Oh, so item number two, I thank you, Madam Mayor. Item number two is second reading for the retail center security requirements, but I think Councilman um, Richard Kite asked for that to be pulled. Yes. Randy, I, I may have missed some of these items the first time it went around. So when I was looking at the, uh, the item for today, I just had a couple of questions regarding a security issue. And I don't know whether Sean is uh, working on this or whether you were, Randy, but I just had a couple of questions. Okay. Uh, first of all, this ordinance is being put in effect for something that's new ongoing. I mean, was there a, an issue that was brought up to us that uh, required this, this new ordinance? We were um, made aware that it's possible that the river might be cutting back on their security, and because it's, one of, it's our largest retail center, we wanted to make sure that we had an ordinance in place that required on-site security for large commercial centers. Have we met with the, um, the owners of the river? We've actually reached out to them, but have not been able to have a meeting yet. Okay. I, I guess the, that question deals with the ordinance itself and whether they would approve the ordinance or whether they thought it would uh, meet their requirements or whether we were asking them to do something that they were presently not doing. Sure, the ordinance actually just reflects what the river has done in the past. It doesn't add anything new as a requirement. Okay, so where it talks about two, uh, two officers or one officer, that's all based on what was past there experience. previously? Yes. Okay. And uh, as far as requirements for any other uh, complexes in the area, uh, would they be bound by the same ordinance uh, that the river would be? Uh, yes, if they're in excess of 200,000 square feet in floor area. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Randy, did they indicate that they were not going to continue the service, the river? We only heard that secondhand. Okay. I would think it would be worthwhile as we go through this process and it's finally approved that we should definitely meet with the river to let them know what the new ordinance states and also get their input as to whether they think it's adequate, not enough, or too much. So. Absolutely, we will do, thank you. I know that we have attempted <clears throat> to make contact on this subject as well as others right? Uh, because we felt that we can contribute uh, to the development of the project and up to this point uh, we've been unsuccessful but I'm sure we'll continue uh, to pursue the security aspect as yeah, well. Security at the river is really important. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, so go ahead. So number three, four, five, and six, uh, we can call on Bruce Harry, our right. public works director. Right. And Bruce is going to be talking to us about <coughs> two and three. 
together. Great. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council, um, item number three today is the approval of an agreement for purchase and sale of uh, Central Mix Riaz for our uh, annual Riaz project. This is slurry seal that we put on our streets. Uh, every other year, the city performs preventative street maintenance services on various public streets by applying the Central Mix Riaz, or called its rubberized emulsion <laughs> aggregate slurry. Uh, similar work was last performed in the fall of 2012. Uh, with a direct purchase by the city of the Central Mix Riaz from Petrochem Manufacturing through a piggyback purchase and sale agreement that PMI has with the City of Los Angeles for production and distribution of the Central Mix slurry. Uh, chapter 3.34 of the Rancho Mirage Municipal Code, which is entitled Public Contracts, uh, allows shared agency purchases in place of public uh, project-specific bidding. The Director of Public Works with consent of the City Manager must first make uh, certain findings with respect to entering into a piggyback contract with another governmental agency. These findings are addressed on page 3-2 of my staff report. PMI is required in the City Agreement before you today to provide 465,000 gallons of Central Mix Riaz over a 25-day period for the City's contractor to place on about 5.6 million square feet of public streets. The project schedule has changed since the writing of the staff report and the reason why I'm presenting this to you today. In that original schedule, we had planned on commencing work on the RIAS starting September 29th and having all the RIAS in place prior to Thanksgiving holiday. However, I was informed by the general contractor that the um, RIAS um, that is to be placed on the streets will not be able to be done at the speci specific time because the equipment that is required to put this RIAS on the streets is unavailable until October 20th. The equipment that we uh, need to use is currently being used by the City of Los Angeles who stepped up their slurry seal program this year due to the threat of a wet winter. And they've acquired all the specialized trucks through mid-October. In addition, uh, PMI, who supplies the RIAS, um, says their ability to supply the city with the product that we need for our project is strained as a result of the City of Los Angeles' contract. Therefore, both the contractor and PMI have requested that we postpone the start of our work till March 30th of 2015 or March of next year, when the needed equipment and the product are more readily available. So staff is recommending that we award the contract today for the purchase and sale of the RIAS to PMI and that the council identify in the contract that the work shall be postponed until March 30th of 2015. Now the second item on the agenda, item number four, relates directly to this item number three. Item number four is the actual award of contract for the contractor to place this slurry on our public streets. Uh, this item, uh, item number four, is for award of contract to Coke Armstrong General Engineering for the placement of the RIAS. Uh, staff solicited a call for competitive bids on August 7th for the placement of the city supplied central mix RIAS. Two bids were received on September 9th, which are identified on page 4 6 of the staff report. Coke Armstrong General Engineering was the low bidder with a bid of $1,021,393.49. The engineer's estimate of probable construction cost was $941,000. The bid proposal submitted by Coke Armstrong Inc. was reviewed and found to be responsive. The bid proposals were compared on an item by item basis and found to be competitive. Coke Armstrong holds a current and active contractor's license and received excellent reference checks. In my staff report on the bottom of page 4 6, this project, as I mentioned, was anticipated to start on September 29th and be completed by November 29th. However, as I mentioned earlier during my presentation on the previous item, the start of date of this project will need to be postponed to March 30th, 2015, for the same reasons stated in the previous item. The city received a letter from Coke Armstrong General Engineering, Inc., dated September 19th, 2014, agreeing to honor their bid prices till March 30th, 2015, and extending through the duration of the contract. Staff recommends that the City Council approve the contract with Coke Armstrong with a start date to be postponed till March 30th of 2015. 
So those are the two items, item three and four. Those are my recommendations to award the contracts. We'll get the contracts executed, and then the start of construction will not start till March 30th of 2015. And that concludes on my report at items three and four. Okay, Question. Richard, you had a uh, Bruce, I'm a little bit concerned about the start date, March 30th. I'm not sure what the dates are of the Kraft Nabisco this year, but normally it's around the first week in April. And uh, that's really a busy time in the city, and to have our streets uh, torn up for two months, I think maybe a little bit, um, uh, well, a little bit too much for the city to withstand at that time. Yeah, I, um, we did consider that. The project has a n uh, number of streets that are in the residential areas that could be done during that week of the craft, and then we'll switch out and do the arterials after the craft Nabisco is finished. So we can concentrate our work in the residential areas while the craft Nabisco is going on so we don't interrupt any of the arterials, if that would be um, okay with the council. Uh, the reason for March 30th, that works good for timing with regards to weather conditions. Uh, we'd like to get the slurry down before it gets too hot because then it becomes uh, soft and tends to track. So the early spring tends to work pretty good, March and April. Okay. Bruce, how long does it take for the slurry to dry so that the streets can be driven on? Typically about two hours. Um, okay. it'll, it'll set up and then we can get traffic back on it. Uh, so we, even for the people who would want to attend the Kraft Nabisco, if they were doing their streets, they would have no problem driving out within two hours? And yeah, normally what we do is we notice the day that we're going to slurry their streets. If they need to get out, they'll park their vehicle on an adjacent street. We always have one travel lane up and down the street always open <laughs> so they can access their properties. Um, but if they do need to get out, they're given uh, 48 hours notice to park their vehicles, which has worked really well. We've never had an issue in the past, and um, I think the uh, uh, people that need to get out will park their vehicles and then access their vehicles by walking to them. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Any comments from the audience? Okay. Audience comments closed, and maybe we could go ahead and make a motion on this. I'll make this a motion to on, approve on two of them. Uh, we'll be approving two at a time. These two, number three and four. That's what I was going to make a motion Good. for. Okay. I will make a motion to approve items three and four, uh, subject to the change in uh, the uh, date as outlined by the um, our director of public works. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Please vote. Okay, motion carries 5-0. Thank you. And while we're at it, why don't we go back and uh, approve number two? We did. Uh, was that already approved? It was already. It actually was approved as part of my original presentation, and then we just talked about it some more. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Uh, then moving on with Bruce mm -hmm. to <coughs> item number five. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, item number five is an award of contract for our annual. Uh, custodial services. Uh, the Public Works Department currently contracts custodial services for the City Hall, City Hall Annex, Library, and our City Maintenance Yard. Uh, the current contract has not been out to bid since 2009. Staff felt it was appropriate to release our RFP, request for a proposal, uh, that would be in the best interest of the city to make sure that we're uh, getting the uh, correct pricing for our services that we're paying for. A request for a proposal for custodial services was released on the city's website on August 8th uh, with a submission deadline of September 3rd. Um, the duration of the contract will be for one year and is renewable on a yearly basis for up to four <coughs> years total. Two vendors attended the pre-proposal meeting held on August 25th. Both of those vendors submitted proposals to the city on September 3rd. Uh, the first proposal was from K KBN KBM Facility Solutions, they are a current contractor. Their uh, price was $107,700. The second uh, vendor was Alley Incorporated, and their price was $223,080. Quite a substantial difference. The current budget for our uh, janitorial services contract is $117,500. So the $107,700 is within budget. A staff review reviewed and evaluated the proposals. 
on an item by item basis. Staff rec recommendation, staff's recommendation is based upon criteria that was set in the RFP that reviewed proposal cost, ability to perform requirements with the proposed manpower, qualifications of their personnel, proposed equipment, past performance, references, and after hours emergency response time. Based on staff's recommendation, the total cost of the annual custodial services will be the 107,700, so staff is recommending award of this contract to the lowest responsible bidder, KBM Facility Solutions. And I'm here to answer any questions, thank you. I do have a question. Where are we with the City Hall Annex when it goes out? Is it in this contract or out of the contract? Yes, we're still required to maintain the Sheriff's substation down at the uh, Annex. We still do some work on the facility that used to be housed by staff, but we are um, needing to maintain it through <coughs> the first of next year. I believe January of 2015 is when it will hopefully convert over to the uh, Rancho Las Palmas Shopping Center developer. And Bruce, when they move, the chamber that is, we don't pick up their cleaning for the new facility? That's correct. This con the contract for the annex portion will be terminated as part of this contract, so that will not be paid for any further after January 1st. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions on council? Any questions from the audience? Okay. Then I have a motion to approve. Move approval. And a second? Second. Okay. Please cast your vote. Motion carries. Five Can I do zero. a point of information, uh, Madam Mayor? Uh, Bruce said he didn't think that item number two had had a motion to, to approve it. Yeah, I, I uh, believe when uh, uh, Councilman Mayor Pro Tem Hobart recommended approval, he did not include two as one of the items. Is that, that's correct. Can, we, can yeah. we check with the clerk on that? I, I would uh, move that we um, adopt the ordinance adding Chapter 8.62 Major Retail Center Security to the Ranch Mirage Municipal Code. Okay. You have a second? Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Please cast your vote. Could you, could you try your votes again for me, please? Motion carries 5 0. Thank you so much. And moving on to item number six. And Bruce is going to be handling this also. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, item number six is the notice of acceptance for the Whitewater Wash Concrete Slope Protection Natina Staining. And the mayor wanted me to speak about this. Uh, we've gotten a lot of compliments on what we did with the concrete lining and the wash. Sarah, do you have a couple of photographs? Um, the concrete slope lining in the wash uh, is put in uh, to protect the slope from erosion during uh, storm events and the gray concrete lining is very popular with regards to graffitiing and things like um, staining. So what we decided to do was uh, use a natural product called Natina and it's a all natural product using manganese and calcium and it reacts with the lime in the concrete and causes the staining so to speak of the concrete to a earth tone color of the brown. Uh, this is this is a product we also use when we cut hillsides down along Highway 111. We used it in two of our hillside cuts, which makes it look more natural so you don't see that gray granite. Um, this uh, product was uh, installed by Natina Products, LLC. Uh, the contract was for $89,618. It, it uh, stained all the concrete lining starting from the Cathedral City limit near the Palm Springs Motors all the way down to Morningside Country Club and the concrete exposed lining around the Ranch Mirage Public Library. The work has been completed. Uh, as you can see, the staining has all turned the earth tone colors that we're all liking to see rather than the gray concrete. Uh, I have had numerous calls from uh, various cities and associations that have concrete lining through their uh, communities and they were very interested in this product and uh, I think it turned out very nice. We've gotten some compliments. We did have one area of graffiti already, which we immediately sandblasted off and retreated, um, and uh, as of today, it has been taken care of. Uh, we're asking the council today to accept the improvements and um, authorize the city clerk to file the notice of acceptance with the county recorder's office. Any questions, I'm here to answer them. 
Any questions from council? Any questions from the public? Okay, then why don't we go ahead and someone make a motion? I will make the motion. Okay. Motion to the city council accepts the subject improvements performed by Natina Products LLC and authorizes staff to record the notice of acceptance with the county recorder's office. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Please cast your vote. Okay, motion carries 5-0. Thank you. And moving on to item number nine. And Thank you, thank you, Madam okay. Mayor. So this report was put together by the city attorney, Steve Quintanilla, and the city's golf club council subcommittee consisting of Mayor Pro Tem Hobart and Councilman Weil. So I turn it over to the three of you. That's you. The Rancho Mirage uh, Golf Club is very important to the city uh, because we feel that uh, it's an important amenity for our residents. And we're just uh, very pleased to have uh, negotiated the extension of this contract for an additional two years. Up to this point, it has been one year and um, we were able to negotiate uh, this. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Hobart uh, met with the Weston, uh, and we've had discussions. We increased the membership uh, fee, a de minimis figure of $5, going from $75 per year to $80, and likewise, a very small increase in the uh, rounds uh, or the the fee per round of two dollars uh, varying uh, at a different time of the year uh, summer versus the winter so we're extremely pleased we have talked to the uh, people that uh, are uh, the organizers and the main people involved with the golf club uh, they're quite delighted and I would uh, I'd like to thank my colleague, Mayor Pro Tem Hobart, for carrying the, uh, the torch uh, uh, while we were off recreating. So I thank you, and uh, a job well done, and we're all very, very pleased. Uh, can I add just a little bit, uh, now that the torch has singed my eyebrows? Uh, the only significant difference that's going to uh, uh, occur uh, is uh, Ted said there's a $2 increase in two categories, uh, but for members of the club who have been a member through Rancho Mirage during this past year, they don't have to come and register again with the city. We will be given a list of all of those people who have been a member uh, in the past that are continuing on and we'll get their updated addresses and emails so that we keep track of who the city uh, has in this club. Uh, anybody who is new to the club must first come to the city, uh, get from us a, uh, a note that they take to the Weston that will ensure that they get the exclusive rates that uh, the Weston gives to the members of the Ranch Mirage City Golf Club. That's the only other addition, and uh, 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 Ted, uh, I thank you for all the work you put into this, and uh, then he and I had to argue over uh, just dozens of things, but most of them were superfluous. Richard? Ted, question for you. With the transition last year to the new program, uh, do you have any uh, numbers which would give us an idea whether our membership increased or decreased over the last year? It's, what remained, our, it's remained pretty constant around uh, 11 to 1,200 members. Okay. And uh, uh, I can tell you the, uh, the number of people and the, the number of comments you get uh, are significant. Uh, golf is a time-consuming uh, and to a certain extent expensive game and the Weston affords our residents the opportunity uh, to participate 
uh, in this without necessarily always uh, belonging to a club, yet it uh, affords them the chance to uh, still participate and recreate. So it's well received and the numbers are holding right around 1,000 to 1,200 members. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Nothing from the council. Any questions from the public? Okay, well let's, uh, someone make a motion to approve? Maybe, <laughs> I'll Dana? I'll move that the city council approve the replacement golf club program operating agreement with Western Mission Hills and approve termination of the existing operating agreement and authorize the city manager to execute both the replacement agreement and the existing agreement. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Please vote. Okay, motion carries 5-0. Thank you so much and thank you both for all your hard work with this. Um, I know our residents are thrilled and um, it gives, as you say, an opportunity for the people who really want to get out there once in a while and, and uh, not have to uh, go to a great expense. So, thank you. All right, moving on now to action items and number 12. And this is something that uh, is going to be handled by David Bryant, I believe. Uh, it's, it's the, uh, pardon me? Okay, so this is something Randy's gonna be handling. And it's a consideration of approval of the Rancho Mirage Observatory project at the Rancho Mirage Public Library. David, did you know you were handling this? Yes or no? I did not. Okay, okay. then I'll go ahead and do it. But I'm happy to contribute. Okay, 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 great, thanks. Madam Mayor, members of the council, uh, this is a unique and exciting project. Uh, this item represents for the city of Rancho Mirage. Think about this, the earth is five billion years old give or take a billion years. In all those years, this is the first time an observatory has been proposed, ever proposed, in the city of Rancho Mirage. So let me explain that. At the Tourism Advisory Committee meeting uh, last year, Mayor Pro Tem Hobart had posed a question to the uh, people that were present. He said, what kind of exciting project would you like to see in the city of Rancho Mirage? One of the attendees suggested that the city look into an observatory. Mayor Pro Tem Hobart suggested that I take a serious look at the concept. Uh, Sylvia Nino, our, um, our, uh, my secretary and secretary to the city council, scheduled a meeting for us to visit Mount Palomar. And she scheduled a meeting with a man by the name of Dan McKenna. Dan McKenna is the site superintendent for the California Institute of Technology, Caltech, at Mount Palomar. So we drove up there, three and a half, four hour drive up the windy road. Mayor Pro Tem Hobart and I sat down with uh, Dan and uh, we were explaining that we wanted to put in a telescope and an observatory close to our library. We could sense that maybe he thought we weren't serious. He's probably had a lot of yahoos come and visit him about putting up telescopes around Southern California. Um, he did, however, give us a tour of the 200 inch hail telescope that they have up there at uh, Mount Palomar, which is terrific. He also relayed to us a fair degree of optimism about our library site, and he even recommended a particular Newtonian reflector telescope for our project. So then we asked him to visit the city's library and ass assess the site for us, and he is here today and he will present his findings. As city manager, I put together a project team led by our city council subcommittee, Councilman Charles Townsend and Mayor Pro Tem Dana Hobart. Our team also includes Library Director David Bryant, Public Works Director Bruce Harry, Senior Planner, Planning Manager Bud Kopp, and Isaiah Hagerman from our Finance Department. We've contracted with Mike Fontana. Mike Fontana Associates would be the city's project manager on this project. So as, as you watch Mr. McKenna's program today, you'll listen to his enthusiasm and you'll begin to fit, get a feel for just how far-reaching this project can really be. There'll be nothing like it in the Coachella Valley or even close. You can think about this as a potential for a symbiotic relationship with the city's library. We've had uh, astronomy lectures at the library in the evening time where young and old alike marvel at the universe. So it's our hope, uh, Madam Mayor, that we can encourage Caltech, who owns and operates Mount Palomar, to partner with the city of Rancho Mirage 
on some academic level to better ensure that we reach the world of potential on this visionary project. So Madam Mayor, if you could please ask Dan McKenna to approach the podium, give us a presentation, and I'm also sure that uh, Councilman Townsend, Mayor Pro Tem Hobart, at some point will have some comments as well. Okay. Well, Dan? well come on up. Welcome to uh, our podium and welcome to our city. Thank you so very much for inviting me up here and uh, sharing my excitement with you on this uh, potentially uh, world-class project. Uh, let's see if this magic works. Can I, uh, can I get to my iPad screen, please? Okay, there it is. So um, let's talk about first um, the result of my survey when approached about this project. Um, we came down and we measured what is commonly referred to light pollution up and down the valley in order to understand better how uh, such a proposal might perform if we had the adequate uh, equipment, instrumentation. So. Up there you see a, a light pollution uh, map and it's, uh, you'll notice Europe over there and it's very, very bright. And we go to the United States and you'll, you'll see the East Coast and up the Beltway, it's a very bright area of the country. And as we head west, um, we start getting back to pristine dark skies until just outside of Los Angeles. So I have a network of light measuring equipment um, all over the world uh, that is calibrated, and so I measure light levels routinely in order to address questions of sky brightness, and I have done so here. So for um, comparison, if we go to a place where the sky is pristine and that dark area, and we call that one sky brightness, and then if we go to a place that's twice as bright, let's just call it two. Astronomers use crazy units like magnitudes per square arc second, but I think that uh, is not the proper way to view this. So when I measured up and down uh, the valley here, I measured brightnesses anywhere from uh, 20 and 30 times a natural sky brightness to um, at the library about 10 to 11, 12 times natural sky brightness. Uh, in contrast, if we go to a place like uh, where our beloved Caltech Institute is, um, we have sky brightnesses in this area exceeding 50 to 70 times. So we're, we're much, we have a much nicer sky than in L LA. Um, as time progresses and we learn more and more about the universe, we find out that uh, unlike past views where it seems not to change much over the periods of times of, of say a lifetime or so, that we now see that the universe uh, consists of, um, of, of phenomena that spans down to fractions of a second. So it, for us, it has been a, cons a constant rediscovery of the sky. And at Palomar Observatory, one of our programs is scanning the skies and we discover a new object uh, about every 20 minutes. So uh, there is a lot out there, uh, and, it, and it is uh, changing at a, an astounding rate. Uh, if we, if we uh, go back to one of these pretty pictures that we, we get from the Hubble Space Telescope, there we go. An external galaxy, you know, that's all made of gas and stars, and in the center, that's probably a supermassive black hole, and, and uh, uh, we, t uh, compare that to where we live, well, not exactly Rancho Mirage, but 
um, in, in, in our neighborhood, we'll see that our galaxy also appears to be this flat kind of pancake thing. And there we go. And if we zoom up where we live here, here we go. We're going to zoom on in. And uh, just past a bunch of planets, and oh, there we are, what is called the big blue marble. And uh, so you can, you, can, you can run the sky around the big blue marble, and you'll notice that you see the constellations just familiar like you were here or someplace on Earth. And as you zoom back, now we're passing through the orbits of several planets, and zoom back farther in what's called a cosmic pullout. Um, there's Venus there, you can see going around. Keep on going. You notice that the constellations aren't changing, which means that the stars are really, really far away. And as we continue to pull out farther and farther, now we start seeing nearby stars and you can see the constellations all get distorted because we are now passing through the stars and we keep on going and there are more stars and now we start to get into some of those external galaxies. There they are. And they're way, way, way out there. In fact, that's been one of the things that Palomar has contributed to is the discovery of what that distant scale is. And then finally, if you go out there, there's the Big Bang. That is the frontier of the universe, and it looks strange and all that, but that is the echo of creation uh, uh, and the sound that it made actually is embedded in that. So, you know, these are really exciting things and quite often for even people within the industry to understand what's going on. And uh, uh, how we got there is uh, through uh, um, the use of telescopes, um, which we are proposing for uh, Rancho Mirage, so if I can have the PowerPoint, that's not my PowerPoint, but I can talk about those. Those are a series of your you know, classical dome structures where you put telescopes in. Of course, uh, the dome is a way to protect the telescope and also provide access to the sky, and it can be built many different ways. We won't want to concentrate on that, but I'm wondering where my, my uh, presentation is. Sometimes the magic works, sometimes it doesn't. Ah, there it is, night at the office. Okay, keeping up to date with the universe while in Rancho Mirage, uh, I work a lot at night, and uh, sometimes I sit there after walking between my office and the dome and contemplate the universe and all that, and so I had the pleasure of contemplating what it might mean to, uh, to, to actually build a state-of-the-art facility unparalleled to none uh, close by. Okay, so uh, this was in, in, uh, in, in collaboration with library. Uh, we're in a desert, um, and uh, libraries also ha always have been considered as an oasis of knowledge, collections of knowledge that go back thousands of years. They've always used the latest media conveyance, whether it be papyrus or microfiche, uh, these days computer. And uh, like uh, Rancho Mirage, uh, uh, great leaders and philanthropists like Carnegie helped to establish most of these major public facilities. And uh, it, it goes to say that in modern time, with the information increasing so fast, it's really, really difficult to keep up with. Now, the biggest book, of course, is the Book of the Sky, because what is written up there uh, not only has our past, but uh, in some ways our future written in it. So it's up to us to be able to access that information. So things are changing all the time, and we're learning a lot. Here is the uh, comet that uh, the European space probe is about to land on. They say it looks like a duck. I'm not quite sure I see a duck in that. I guess I can kind of see a rubber ducky. But these kinds of objects pass through our solar system all the time. Uh, some of them have the potential to strike the planet. So they can always be very uh, controversial and in, in, in a topic that uh, comes up in everyday conversations. 
we have a long history of the contemplation of the universe, so this, is, this, this kind of thing is at our roots. Telescopes uh, have helped us bring uh, the universe closer, and uh, modern technology has expanded our horizons. That happens to be our, our proud uh, Hale 200-inch telescope. Uh, and uh, we have been asked uh, almost constantly by visitors, well, aren't you guys, aren't you guys uh, getting a little oh, obsolete because of the way the city is getting brighter and brighter and you know, making it harder for you to work? The answer to that is no. Uh, actually, our telescopes are now being pushed to the limit. We're running them as fast and as hard as we can because modern technology has so far exceeded what was done uh, when the first observatory uh, opened that we are uh, getting data that is over a thousand times better with each exposure. So we're actually doing more uh, work than we've ever done before. And so we'd like to apply the same kind of technology uh, to the Rancho Mirage concept. This is the CDK 700. It's a 28-inch uh, Cassegrain uh, Nismith, which means that instead of looking from behind it, you have uh, ports on each side, so it can hold two instruments at each time. Uh, there is two of these telescopes in what's called Minerva. It's a planet finder. It searches for planets around nearby stars, and this is located at the moment in Pasadena, very, very bright skies, and it is used nightly to test a concept. It will be moved to Arizona later. There's the humble beginning of an observatory. It's not actually complex technology, cement and all that, but it has to be done right. Uh, you're only as good as your eye, uh, and our eye in this case is a camera, so the observatory will be equipped with two cameras, one for taking long dim exposures and the other one for taking quicker exposures in, in color. There is the road to exoplanets. That's what it looks like within the clamshell enclosure. We're not suggesting that. So here is a short of exposure from Pasadena of an external galaxy in M51. You can see that uh, it, it does quite well. And there's a great nebula in Orion. Uh, once again, um, a, a telescope of that aperture with uh, the cameras can, it can, can really do some exciting stuff. So, the sky is of classical interest. It captures the imagination of most. It's ever-changing, always something new. Literally, what happens in the sky can have a profound impact on the Earth. And what we'd like to do is present this as a unique concept of check out the universe from Rancho Mirage so that any interested person does not have to have a large degree of training, can come to the library and uh, use the software that exists there. And it has been now developed to a set and forget level where you can program it in and walk away. And there's an app for that. You can even run it on your iPhone or iPad. So, for example, a school student could be operating uh, the telescope from their house and taking data for a project or a community member or even one of the city council, if so interested, could uh, bring up, uh, as they program the telescope through simple commands, um, a sequence which will yield pretty pictures. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's absolutely remarkable information and what an amazing opportunity we have to allow our public and our children, our adults, to uh, tap into something that uh, most people would never have the opportunity to do. So, any council comments? Dana? Yes, if I may. If I may, I would like to add uh, to some of what uh, Dan McKenna has told us. Uh, first, I'd like to mention that um, when we had that meeting at the Westin uh, over a year ago, uh, and I had asked that question that Randy mentioned about, did anybody have any good ideas? 
for something new and different in the city. Uh, Marilyn Bauer, a local resident and a realtor, uh, was the one who had shouted out the word observatory. Um, and uh, over the next month or so, a couple of months, I kept thinking back about that and thinking, no, it wasn't possible, and then thinking, well, yes, it might be possible, and then talking to Randy about it, and then we met with uh, Mr. McKenna and l learned uh, that it was possible uh, on a budget that uh, made sense. For example, the um, telescope that Mr. McKenna has identified, which is one that he has described as being you would have you would never have to apologize for your telescope being inadequate uh, and that this telescope will cost uh, just under um, three hundred thousand dollars to something less than three hundred even installed uh, we set aside uh, six months ago or so uh, uh, one point uh, seven five million dollars uh, to uh, serve as a budget for this project should we move forward with it as we develop more information. <clears throat> the um, connection between the library and <clears throat> the deck that houses the telescope and the house that the telescope is in uh, is very important for us to understand. <clears throat> the concept is <clears throat> that we will find some material Maybe Mr. McKenna has some thoughts on this, that we will find some material that we can either roll up or pull out or do something with for the interior of the library to give it a dome-like effect uh, at the ceiling level <clears throat> so that we have that, that picture uh, sort of of the horizon and uh, outer space that we have in most uh, planetariums. Is it planetaria? Probably. Uh, at any rate, <clears throat> uh, we feel pretty confident, uh, particularly with the input that we've had from Mr. McKenna, uh, that uh, uh, this can come to fruition. This is not a pipe dream, and it's not an expense that the city can't meet. <clears throat> the money that we've set aside is former RDA money. Fortunately, the library and the prospective observatory and planetarium uh, are within that uh, same district, and that money is available to us, uh, which is a wonderful uh, concept. Uh, but the idea is to have the library, the planetarium. As <clears throat> Mr. McKenna pointed out, uh, I guess he has uh, to us personally, or me personally, people don't walk into an observatory and look into the eyeglass. Uh, I think the statistics that Mr. McKenna gave us is, at best, one out of six will be able to say, oh, yeah, I can see what you're talking about. <laughs> well, as we just saw demonstrated here, uh, we can have the projection from the telescope be more meaningful to us, just as the displays that Mr. McKenna presented to us are much more meaningful. When we could see an entire galaxy turned and rolled and even looked at from a perspective that it looks almost like a, uh, a fudge plate. Uh, uh, it, it's a fascinating concept. And the ideas that we're going to be examining, and <clears throat> with the help of hopefully with Mr. McKenna and Caltech and Mike Fontana, <clears throat> who is um, uh, intended to be our, uh, our project uh, leader on this, the developer, to help us build this that we can turn the interior of the uh, library into the planetarium where people will have the opportunity of seeing the visions that uh, unfold through the telescope. On the outside, where we're going to have the telescope in the building that houses it, we'll, we're also considering having <clears throat> a deck, a substantial deck that people can walk on and that'll have four to six stanchions where amateur astronomists in, I almost said astrologists, my gosh, my, my, my wife would have understood, but nobody else would have. <laughs> uh, that, the idea is to have these stanchions on which amateurs can place their telescopes and, and 
tie them down to give them the stability they need because uh, the information that we have is that there is a fairly substantial astronomy uh, collection of people out here who are really into the stars and who have extremely good equipment and we're hoping that we can develop this into a center for astronomers, amateur and professional to gather. Uh, we're looking forward to having uh, some of the leading authorities uh, in the world perhaps if we can put together the relationship with Caltech that we, we think and hope uh, is available. Uh, I understand from Caltech's perspective they are excited about the thoughts of what we're doing here as we move forward with this project as being extremely unique, uh, probably nothing like it, uh, certainly uh, in a small city, probably uh, anywhere. Yes, large cities have planetariums, uh, but nothing <clears throat> that uh, comes from uh, uh, an area that is uh, in need for academic uh, achievement and development. We have COD and we there's at least one professor there that is significant in the field, uh, is thrilled at the thought of us having such a project. Um, we have the new high school, which probably does not offer a course in astronomy now, but may very well if we put this project together. Uh, the world of potential for the education of uh, the valley, for the education of our residents, and for the pride of our residents to know that we have um, a truly unique uh, device uh, and operation. Uh, it's got to be uh, is totally thrilling uh, to most people to conceive of this. It certainly is to me. I'd like to thank Dan personally for uh, taking Randy and me under his wing. Uh, when we were up there, we, we didn't know the questions to ask, and he helped us formulate and articulate the questions, and then he would provide the answers. And when he came down here uh, a month or two ago, and he took light tests, uh, I remember at the time, uh, the next day, uh, he told us that he had taken light te testing at the Palm Springs end <clears throat> and the Indio end of the valley. Indio had a, a don't know what the right word is, Dan, but had a reading of 50. I mean, fi uh, in the area of 50. Palm Springs had a reading in the area of 80. Rancho Mirage had a reading of 11, 10 or 11. The disparity between all of that was almost like a miracle hitting us that, my gosh, uh, this is the perfect place. And we have the greatest library, small library, uh, certainly in the state, if not in the country. We have it right next to it. It'll become a component of it. Uh, just a vast world of opportunity. Uh, and I certainly hope that our council uh, adopts the program and that we move forward with it and that we move forward with it with Caltech uh, as a, uh, an associate partner of some sort. Uh, it's just a, thanks to you, Dan, we've gotten as far as we have, and we deeply appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Thank Chair. You. Thank you, Dana. Uh, any other comments from Council? I do. For those of us who grew up in Los Angeles and had the privilege of going to the planetarium and seeing the shows through history, I think, Mike, we talked at our meeting that there are programs that could be shown through history just like the planetarium. And I think that's fabulous to be able to see history in the skies as it was. That's another great benefit. Thank you. Ted, any comments? Okay, Richard. Question, uh, really an exciting opportunity here. Um, I heard a discussion of a domed facility talked about, are we gonna be building anything on the, op on the empty property adjacent to the library parking area? That's a good thing. Me, Randy, why don't you answer that? Because that is something that's important here. That yeah, have. you know, when we first looked at it, we assumed that we were going to use the three acres at the end of the parking lot. Mm -hmm. When we um, 
and we had Mike Fontana come out and take a look at it, and we realized that we're talking about a um, observatory dome that might be 16 or 18 foot in diameter and is essentially a prefab structure. Uh, rather than using up that space, because we can save that for another use, we found a spot that's just outside the children's section at the library by the fire road there adjacent to the um, Whitewater River Channel that would be perfect a perfect location for this. We wouldn't have to install new bathrooms because you could use the bathrooms that are in the library and also it's adjacent to the community room so people can go walk from the observatory in the deck right into the community room and be able to see on high definition television what the telescope's looking at. So while we originally thought that would be the right location for it, we've determined that right next to the library would be better and to save that site for another use. Yeah, sounds like it. Uh, the reason I raised the question is we've got a couple of residential areas adjacent to that empty lot, Thunderbird Palms, uh, Thunderbird Cove, Thunderbird Terrace, and then also Sunrise behind it. So it may be worthwhile as we get through the project that we bring these people out to a public meeting, maybe at the library, and not only show them what the program's all about, but also uh, alleviate any fears that they might have of something being built uh, adjacent to the library that may, some way may uh, create uh, a, a negative feeling for them. So I'm just thinking that as the program goes forward, uh, an education program with the residents in the area would certainly be worthwhile. Certainly. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, we also have a comment from someone in the audience, Richard Wood. Please come up. Richard is from Rancho Mirage also. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor and City Council. My name is Richard Wood. I live in Rancho Mirage. My job is easy because I'm going to get to preach to the choir. This is a fantastic idea. I just read about it today, so I stopped everything to come here to tell you what I think about it. I believe that, that this wasn't well publicized, and if other people could, could have read about this, they'd be very excited. Uh, it's an opportunity to do something uh, that's going to expand science. <clears throat> I can see all types of opportunities. I can see... Uh, online access to this telescope where students could have a certain time where they could log on and they could do their own experiments and science projects. Uh, College of the Desert could use it. Uh, there may be a time that the city could make available uh, to the general public in uh, the valley where they could log on at a certain time and control this telescope and look at whatever they want it to. It's pretty neat. Uh, my understanding is the scope, it won't be optical, it'll be electronic, so that they won't be standing at the telescope looking through a lens. They'll be looking at the image electronically projected onto a screen or sent down the internet to their computer. That's, that's my, and if you had a planetarium in the library, it wouldn't be the old-fashioned one with the light bulb in the center with the holes in it. It would actually be a projection system that would be showing you in real time what's actually going on. Right. Okay. The, the one thing that crossed my mind, and I, I don't, I, I want to be, I'm 100% positive on this, is just to consider, perhaps, and I don't know um, if it's been done, is to uh, measure the light. Th this, I don't want to change your project, but just to consider the Annenberg estate, which is very large and has nothing around it for a large distance. Perhaps, since people aren't actually walking up to that scope to look through it, if you located it at the Annenberg Center, it may be much, you may, you may find a level, instead of 11, you may find a level of five there. Because if you, if you think about how, how much there is an unused space around that, there's a lot of space, and there isn't anything really large around there. It, it may be that at night, that certain other large light sources would make it different. The other point is that at the library, you've got a range of hills in the back there to the um, south that may block how far you can lower that telescope down. Whereas out at the Annenberg Center, you're more in the open desert area. You may, you may have a wider range you can use. Now, maybe there could be some kind of a, of a, a display saying this is what the telescope looks like, but it's really located for optimum performance. Because again, I don't see people walking up to it and looking through the eyepiece and saying, oh yeah, that's M51, thank you very much. They're gonna be much happier looking at a screen. So the question is, does it make sense to even consider where you're gonna locate that? Does it have to be at the library if, if there's a better place in Rancho Mirage that you can easily locate it? That's just something to think about. Okay, well thank you so much for your recommendation. Thank you. 
One point with respect to the Annenberg Estate, uh, if we did it at the Annenberg Estate, there would be no way people could come and locate their own telescopes in the region there on the stanchions that we're planning on putting. And the uh, Annenberg uh, people are uh, not particularly uh, um, open to having uh, anything where people are going to be walking around. You don't have to do it that way, I understand. We could have the telescope there, period. Yeah, no, I, I, I follow you perfectly. And it's a good thought. It is darker. Mm -hmm. uh, but dealing with the Annenberg Estate takes a lot of time and a lot of effort, and nothing gets done without the trustees making. That's an idea. Yeah, and a good one. Thank you. Thank you again so much. Any other comments from the audience? Any more comments from uh, the council? Okay. Well, uh, what a thrill it is to have uh, Mr. McKenna here and to share with us the possibilities that uh, we can have something like this and that Dana and uh, uh, Randy have been so involved and that, that uh, Charlie's going to be involved soon. And, and it's just a, a thrilling opportunity. So why don't we have someone make a motion? If I may. I move that the City Council Library Board of Directors endorse the Rancho Mirage Observatory project with the budget set forth in the staff report and direct staff and the subcommittee to proceed with the project at the Rancho Mirage Public Library. I second it. Okay. Well, we have a motion and a second. Please vote. And the motion carries 5-0. What a thrill. <laughs> Yay. And thank you again, Dana and, uh, and Randy. Thank you very much for this, for the library as well. Thank you. Thank you, David. Okay. All right. So now we'll be moving on to the next item, which is item number 13. And uh, Randy, you'll be taking care of this. Thank you, Madam you. Mayor. I will be turning this over to Johnny Almy, our executive coordinator. She'll be talking about amendment number two to the Animal Adoption Incentive Program. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, City Council members. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon and to bring forward this proposed amendment. And um, as you know, the program um, started in 2009, and Mayor Pro Tem Hobart was very instrumental in getting that program started. In uh, 2011, it was amended, and since that time, 118 pets have found their forever homes. And that's important not only to the residents of Rancho Mirage but, and to our council, but to myself as well. I have rescue animals, and, you know, they're just precious. Um, the proposed amendment came forward by uh, Mayor Pro Tem Hobart, I, I believe because there is a need. And, um, you know, as we know, as you know, we do have this incentive program. People are able to adopt a pet from Coachella Valley Animal Rescue and or any of the 501c3s in the valley. But it only capped out to $100, and that was just for the adoption. But, you know, some of these pets that are rescued, you know, they need vaccinations. They need to be microchipped, spayed, neutered, just like this young dog that came in today who, you know, was... Basically, he's going to be able to find a home. But all those services needed to be done, and he needed to be microchipped because that is now something that has to be done for your pet. And a lot of people don't have that extra money to have those services. And if they want to adopt a pet, it costs money. And uh, so what this amendment would do, it would give someone an opportunity to adopt a pet. They have the $100 that we would be able to help them, but it gives them an extra $200 for those services, for the spay, the neuter, the vaccinations, the microchipping. So it would cap everyone at $300. And um, we do have some money set aside. We have $5,000 we could amend, do a budget amendment to help people uh, be able to adopt these animals. And if you have any questions, I'm here to answer them. Thank you so much, Johnny. That was wonderful. And it's nice to see you up here. Yes. Just a bit to that. Johnny and I have been working together on this. And thank you, Johnny. And uh, I think that's the first time I've heard you give a staff report. And uh, you did it with a plum and skill. Thank you. Um, 
I uh, <coughs> met with uh, Fred Sanders, Saunders of the uh, Animal Samaritans. Their uh, establishment is just across the freeway, north of the freeway, in Thousand Palms. Uh, and what they have offered to do for us in this is anybody who wants to take their dog uh, for any, any of a variety of services, they will provide services for them at this uh, rate of uh, charges, uh, which is extremely good. Spay and neutering dogs, uh, $85. Spay and neutering cats, 60. Rabies vaccination, 16. Bordetella shots, 16. DHPP, $21. FELV, $21. FVRCP, $16. No office fee. And they'll do microchip chipping for $25. Uh, those will be the services that we would cover up to a uh, maximum of $200 uh, for such services. And um, we're hoping that this will encourage particularly that people spay and neuter their pets. Uh, without spaying and neutering pets, dogs and cats, uh, the, anesthe the uh, anesthesia, yes, anesthesia, but the euthanasia rates will continue to skyrocket uh, we've just got to bring the euthanasia rates down, and uh, we're hoping that this program that the city is offering to our residents will motivate our residents to both adopt animals, but also if you have your own, if you already have an animal, spay and neutering uh, these rates, we will reimburse as well. So we urge you to take advantage of the program and uh, do what you can to lower the animal death rate in Ranch Mirage. Thank you, Dana. Any other comments from council? Just a question. Uh, Johnny, when you were going through your presentation, you said $300? Yes. If I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, right. I, it would be if you were going to adopt a pet, we would reimburse the $100. But if that pet had to be vaccinated, it had to be spayed and neutered, sometimes they are already vaccinated or spayed or neutered, um, we would, in addition to the $100, cap up to 200. Okay, That's so if the, you were going to adopt. The 200 would be for the services provided. The 100 would be just for the adoption. That is correct. Okay. And right now we're just doing the 100. That is correct. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other comments? This, uh, this, pro um, this program would be available to all residents of the city, all city employees <laughs> as well. So just wanted to make that comment. Okay. Any comments from the audience? Okay, and thank you for clarifying that, Dana, because uh, I think there are a lot of people out there whose animals do not have all the services that we are going to provide uh, as far as vaccinations and spaying and neutering. And as you say, that is one of the most important part of animal control as, uh, as far as uh, the euthanasia. So I think this is something that we're all just thrilled uh, that we can do something like this. So. Uh, if someone would like to make a motion. I'll make a motion. The City Council amend the Animal Adoption Incentive Program and approve a budget adjustment in the amount of $5,000 to broaden the scope of the program to include <coughs> reimbursement for spay, neuter, vaccination, and microchip, microchip services up to $200 per animal, $300, including adoption. Okay. Do you have a second? I'll second. second it. Yeah. Okay. Charlie seconded. Yeah. Please vote. <clears throat> I do have a question. Dana, where are we with feral cats? I know that, you know, we have three that we took in and had spayed and neutered, but that's a big issue and a big problem, I know, in our development. Is there any, any way that, that uh, people can have the feral cats captured? I know we captured them ourselves, bought the cage and took them in. But it, it is an issue with, with a lot of uh, uh, residents in Ranch Mirai. So. Well, it's a giant uh, issue. As a matter of fact, um, the animal shelter uh, has advised that about 5% of the cats that they have for adoption actually find homes. And feral cats, uh, when they're caught, well, they're caught by coyotes a lot. Uh, but when they're caught by uh, animal regulation authorities, 
um, they get taken to the shelter, but you just don't want to be a cat in the Coachella Valley, probably anywhere else compared That's to true. dogs. True. You can be a cool cat. But <laughs> But I don't think there is an answer that's uh, one that's satisfactory, Charlie. Yeah. Well, we t we did take ours in when they were little kittens. They came came to the door, and we did capture them, took them in, and paid twenty dollars to have them done. And they clipped their ears, which means that if if uh, we send out anybody to pick them up or anybody complains, they will not euthanize the uh, feral cat. I just want everybody to know that because they will clip the ear, and that neuters them. So. That's what we did with ours. Great. Okay. Good for you. That is interesting information. Better to also. adopt it, though, next time. Yeah. <laughs> yes. All right. Any other comments? I think we have had a, uh, a motion and a second, and we voted. So uh, I believe the vote came in 5-0. Uh, so the motion carries, and we're all set with that. And now moving on to the public hearings and item number 14. And this is Jeremy Heim, who's going to uh, handle this for us. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the council. Uh, good afternoon. For your consideration is appeal case number APP14001. It was submitted in regards to the Planning Commission's denial of minor conditional use permit, case number CUP14005. The purpose of the minor conditional use permit was to let remain a private basketball court which was built without the benefit of city approvals. The subject property lies at 72280 Tanglewood Lane and exists with the, within the Mission Ranch neighborhood. The applicant was given the development standards as they pertain to private basketball courts in January of this year. Uh, the basketball court as it has been constructed does not meet those standards. The Mission Ranch Homeowners Association is opposed to the project and has submitted two separate letters that, uh, well, to that effect, uh, both of which were attached to the staff report. In addition to the letters which were submitted by the Homeowners Association, two additional letters of opposition were submitted from neighbors within the Mission Ranch community. Again, both of these letters were attached to the staff report. Staff is recommending that the Planning Commission's unanimous denial of CUP14005 be upheld. Uh, I thank you for your time here today and would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Uh, any questions from the council? Okay. Jeremy, could you uh, just briefly uh, go over the applicants uh, response uh, to pre discussions that we have had with them regarding this property. Uh, yeah, uh, Councilman Kite. Basically, um, when we were first contacted, the applicant wanted to ascertain whether or not permits would be required for a basketball court. Um, the answer to that is yes. Um, he went on to, to ask, as is often the case in such projects, whether building permits or planning approvals were needed for flat work, uh, flat work being hardscape walkways, uh, concrete patios, pavers, uh, stuff like that. Uh, the answer to that is no. There are no permits required and no planning approvals needed for flat work, and there are no setback uh, requirements for such projects. Um, so the, at the conclusion of the conversation, um, what was relayed to the city and to the homeowners association was that the applicant was going to pour a concrete slab as a, as a patio essentially and would use portable or roll away basketball goals when he wished to use it as a basketball court and uh, when he wasn't using them he would store them away so at the end of the day it essentially acts as a piece of furniture on a patio. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, Jeremy, what is it that is specifically not per permitted in the area that, that the basketball, I guess the uh, pole and hoop, hoops? Uh, in, the, in the instance of a, a sports court, uh, the entire court has to be set back 10 feet from all property lines. Does that include the cement? Includes the cement. 
Yeah, if it's, an, if, it's a, if it's a project that's built for the purpose solely of a sports court and has to be 10 feet from the property line. For instance, when tennis courts are proposed, they have to be set back uh, a minimum distance and also recessed at least four feet below the grade uh, to mitigate noise and light and such. Um, so that's, bas that's the basis for the court. Um, any, any sports court for that purpose would have to meet the setback. On, the, uh, on page 14-3 of the original uh, staff report, uh, down at the last sentence on uh, that page, it said Mr. Blue was told that no permits would be required if, in fact, he were to pour a slab and use portable basketball goals, dot, dot, dot. Flat work does not require permits. How do you distinguish the flat work of the cement for the basketball court and the cement where chairs are going to be the, seated? The, the entire slab was poured for the, there was no slab there previously. It was a sand volleyball court. So the entire project was built uh, as a new development. So um, we came to the conclusion that if you use the portable goals, that would be fine. but in the instance that he affixed those goals to the court as a permanent structure, then it triggered the need for a, a, a minor conditional use permit. The photograph that's up there, does that, does that depict the, uh, this is the portable uh, uh, basketball hoop? Those are permanently affixed to the, to the slab. I see. Now what's behind it to the right on the photograph is slab cement right the just on, on the ground level on the ground level um there's some there's about three feet well 3.22 feet from the property line from the neighboring home yeah. uh, and in between there is just uh, dg it's rock okay the 3.22 feet from the property line that is or is not uh, impermissible that should be 10 feet from the property line. The so edge. it should be dirt up till up to 10 feet from the property line. It should be just nothing but dirt. Well, correct. Um, in, in the instance that he created this project solely for the use as a basketball court, yes. So well, if he had created it for for roller skating on it, would it be different? Uh, just, just going by what the code says, um, any any development that's solely produced for a, a sports court has to be 10 feet from the property line. Now, if you're asking if, for instance, the the whole backyard was concrete, um, and then he wanted to erect basketball goals at some location. Well, we'd have to look at that in a different scenario, but the fact that he poured the concrete slab where there was none before for this purpose um, basically <coughs> is what we're dealing with at this point. The, the thing I'm dealing with, and maybe uh, Steve, I know Steve wants to say something, but when he was told that no permits would be required if, in fact, he were to pour a slab and use uh, portable goals, flat work does not require permits. Is that, that doesn't mean that he would be permitted to lay a cement slab up to the boundary, but rather only up to 10 feet from the boundary. If he was pouring a slab just for the purposes of pouring a patio, there are no setback requirements. He could pour it all the way up to the property line. So what he did is that he converted this from patio use to a sports court, which requires a permit because he has a, he has fixed hoops. Correct. That's okay. So it was the act of conversion, uh, if indeed they were separated. Otherwise, it speaks for itself. But if even but if he were allowed to pour a slab for anything he wanted, just for walking purposes, that would be okay. But you would have to be careful not to uh, put in a um, basketball hoop closer than 10 feet. Correct. Is that right, Steve? Yeah. So if he, the recommendation the staff has is he removes the permanent goals and just has a rollaway ones, 
then he doesn't need anything from us. Doesn't need a permit. That's correct. So he, he has that option, or he has the the other option is to comply with the setbacks for the sports court. Correct. So he'd have to cut. He, he would essentially feet. have to saw cut the slab back to the 10 foot setback line, correct? So these are the city options. Where are the HOA options? Who controls what? The HOA agreed to accept whatever the city requirements were. The HOA said that they would they would endorse the project if it met the city's requirements of the 10 foot setbacks or the rollaway goals. And their requirement is 12 feet, but they've acquiesced to cut it to 10 feet. Is that correct? That's correct. The Mission Ranch Homeowners Association has more restrictive setback requirements than does the city, but they. Uh, they agreed to give a variance in this case if the project met the city's minimum standards. Am I correct that if the um, the appellant property owner were to remove the permanent basketball uh, st stands and hoops and move them or get a portable, we'll say, or otherwise move them in, um, they could still according to the HOA and according to us, they could still allow the cement slab to go up to the property line, or would they have to tear that out as well? No, if they converted, if they removed the permanent, permanently affixed goalpost from the slab and utilized the portable ones, then there's no, there's nothing Nobody else. Nobody would care. That's correct. I mean, it may be a technical violation, but it would slide. Correct. Jeremy, he could also remove those from three point two feet to 10 feet and affix them to the concrete, couldn't he? They don't have to be portable. Well, the, the, the court itself, the edge of the court itself has to be 10 feet if it's in fact used solely for a sports court purpose. Okay. So he removes the, the standards from where they are now, puts them 10 feet from the property line and affixes them. He can do that also. Well, they're, they're currently affixed. Um, I believe they're approximately approximately 11 feet from the rear property line, and I think it's close to 20 from the side. So that the issue of where the goalposts themselves stand isn't really the issue. It's the issue that the slab encroaches uh, within 10 feet to the setback. I thought you said that was okay if you pulled the uh, goalpost. The uh, hoops, hoop posts. That's correct. Back. But Mr. Kite, as I understood it, um, he asked if he have, if he affixed them permanently at the 10 foot setback, right. would we allow it to stay as it is? No. Well, why why wouldn't we allow it if he moved it to the 10 foot? You're saying if he moved it to 10 foot and put permanent, made it a permanent uh, hoop there, that he would have to then tear out the cement. It's the slab that needs to be moved back. Correct. To the it's the slab, the permanent goal post. not the goalpost. Well, let, let me see if I understand this correctly. If he puts if he puts a goalpost in and it's a temporary goalpost, let's say a movable one, mm -hmm. he can leave the slab alone. Correct. Yes. But if he plants it, then he's got to remove the slab ten feet from the property line. Yes. I mean, it sort of seems. Yeah, I odd. agree. I agree. I mean, wouldn't would the HOA agree? I mean, if the, if he's going to if he's going to have to move it, what do we care, and what does the HOA care if he makes it a permanent or a temporary, as long as he doesn't move it any closer than that, and just leave the slab alone, whichever it is. Well, the, the issue per the municipal code is that any any development, if it's intended for a sports a sports court purpose has to be 10 feet from the property line. Okay, but now if he intended it to be for just an area to walk, mm -hmm. then it would be okay. Right, if the, if the goal is... Mean, if he put, put it in today and he says, I'm going to put the goalpost in 10 feet and I'm going to now pave this over here, it's not going to be part of the, part of the uh, basketball court, it's just going to be where I can walk. We're okay with it. I mean, we don't want to get hung up on... If it's a temporary post, you can have the slab. If it's a permanent post in the exact same position, you can't have the slab. 
I mean, that's kind of inconsistent, although I do see the difference. Uh, and maybe the HOA is concerned that a temporary post gets moved, gets closer, but if it did, he would know that somebody would be shooting that, measuring it, and uh, he would be he'd be lost in this court of appeal. Well, but, if, but isn't the they, HOA uh, in control of this? Huh? Doesn't the HOA still trump whatever we would say? Well, that's yeah. for them to decide. We, we're only talking about our yeah our our rules. But whatever we do, they still have the last word. Whether they do or not, what do we care? I we only you. care about what our word is. Okay. And the HOA has stated that they would go along with whatever our final decision was. They, they stated that they would uh, endorse the project if it met the minimum requirements as called out in the city's municipal code. Steve, can we uh, go ahead and allow him to move the post 10 feet out on a permanent basis and allow him to keep the concrete in? You're the regulator, so yes, you can do that. Well, it would make but more I understand sense to do that. Right. I mean, that's my whole point. I mean, if we say, yeah, you can have your conditional use permit, if you make that you make that a permanent thing that you can't adjust and when nobody's looking, move it back closer to the property line. If you make it permanent there, then it's permanent, and we can waive the requirement that he's got to dig up 10 feet of uh, right. cement slab, which makes no sense. Uh, Madam Mayor, you probably yes. should go ahead and do the public hearing and then close it and then have the yeah. finish our discussion. Let's see okay. where they stand on it. All right. We have a, a D. Lowell uh, McGrain who would like to speak from Rancho Mirage. And there's also a letter in the, in the yes. record. Thanks. Yes. Uh, Madam Mayor, Council, staff. I, uh, my name is Lowell McGrain. I live in Rancho Mirage, specifically Mission Ranch. Um, I am on the homeowners board. Uh, our concern is the fact that Mr. Blue took the option, he was given two options. One, he could put a patio and a portable thing that he could use when he wanted to use it. We don't have a problem with that. The city doesn't have a problem with that as far as your regulations or he could put in a sports court. But you do have a specific set of regulations that control sports courts. And what he's done is just done an end run around all your laws, all your regulations, your zoning, you know, conditions. Threw in the slab, waited until the dust settled, slept in the uh, permanent uh, things and Jeremy, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe he was told that if he put in permanent goals, he would be converting it into a sports court, which would then be illegal. The, the only conversations I had were uh, prior to him commencing or you know, starting the work, and uh, basically he was told what would be expected of him, and the next time I heard was from the Homeowners Association that uh, the, the basketball court had been constructed and permanent goals had been installed. That, that was the conversations that I had. Okay. Uh, there is one other item I would like to mention, and that is I didn't even know about this until the uh, planning commission hearing, which rejected his application unanimously, by the way. He has also installed night play lighting. Okay, why don't we just wait until you have an opportunity to come up and speak. Okay, go ahead. That is, I was unaware of it, but it was brought to my attention by the next door neighbor, uh, Dr. David Frischia, who sent a letter that you have a copy of. Um, one of the members of the Planning Commission before they unanimously rejected this scenario was to say he hasn't one, done one thing right but if he had wanted to put those lights in, he would have required an additional use permit, which he has never even asked for. From the homeowner standpoint, we are concerned primarily about precedent. I don't like to see people allowed to make 
a fool of the laws and the regulations. To be blunt, we can't approve it because we can't change our CCNRs practically, and it would require that for us to approve it. That's the association's position. Okay, go ahead. Mm -hmm. What you would have to do in that circum circumstance would be to um, seek an injunction against him or something from the court to uphold the CCNRs. Is that right? To be honest with you, we have not gotten a legal opinion as far as okay. what we would have to do because we hoped and presumed that the right. city council would uphold your own laws. Well, let, uh, with respect to the lights, that's not before us, is it? Or is it? Okay, well, the light just issue makes lights. it one more step yeah, illegal. Well, let, the light issue, <laughs> the light issue isn't our issue. Right now, our issue is the slab and the permanency or the temporary of the uh, basketball poles. Mm -hmm. uh, if if the city gave him a conditional use permit to make that temporary uh, basketball stand a permanent one, it would have it would have a dual effect. It would have the effect of the homeowners association not having to worry about him moving it in a direction toward his neighbor's yard, making it larger if he decided he wanted to do that. It would prevent him from doing that, which seems to me to be an appropriate thing from your perspective. It would also allow the city to say to him, you don't have to tear up the cement back there, which once you've laid it and it's part of the, the uh, motif of the house and the outside, landscaping and so forth, you want to try to preserve rather than destroy something. I mean, from a council's perspective. Yes, it's given him a little something that the planning commission didn't think he deserved, that you don't think he deserves, and maybe none of us think he deserves, but maybe it's an out that works and brings peace and harmony, which is kind of what I'm aiming at. In other words, wouldn't you rather see him be required to put a permanent pole at that point where the temporary pole would be instead of it being a temporary pole that he might inch back as time passed or as neighbors changed or whatever. Uh, the problem I believe we're having here in the communication is that you don't, you're not um, accepting the concept that what creates a sports court by your terminology, okay, then means it has to have setbacks, it has to have this, it has to have that, et cetera. Um, well, I read, I read to you the thing that got me started on all this was here in the staff report. Mr. Blue was told that no permits would be required, in fact, if he were to pour, to pour a slab uh, and use portable. Uh, go, uh, basketball goals. Flat work does not require permits. Yeah, you, you're right. It, the, it's language. and But the substance of it is, are we going to make somebody tear up 10 feet of cement when we could achieve something a little bit better, even though it's a violation, a tech, it may be a technical violation. You're saying what was in his mind. Suppose he said, suppose he passed the lie detector test and it said, uh, question, Do, did you intend when you said to your HOA that this wasn't going to be part of your basketball court, but rather part of your, your backyard, you know, motif? Uh, and if he, I don't know whether you can pass that or can't pass that, but is that what the, is that what the whole thing is going to roll, roll out to be and decided upon? It's just the only thing he ever submitted to the HOA was a plan with drawings, with um, the foundation mounted um, permanent courts or permanent goals from the sports court company of uh, Los Angeles with unacceptable setbacks and creating a sports court that was illegally close to a line by our regulations and by the city. Let's stipulate and it we is. Could it's not illegal. Let's, 
Let's agree to that because it is. And we could not Probably. and did not approve that. And we can't approve it now. But you can get an injunction against them if you wanted to go to that effort, and I know you don't want to, and I don't blame you. Who wants to go to court to tear out 10 feet of, of cement? But in no. the overall scheme of things, what's the difference of him being able to have the slab and a temporary gold post versus him keeping the slab, although technically under this hypothetical, you're not supposed to, and putting a permanent post where the temporary is going to be. What is the difference to the HOA? What's the difference to anybody except him? He's got a shorter basketball court than he thought he was going to have. And by making it permanent, he can't inch it back when nobody's looking. No place to inch it back now. Huh? It's so close to the... Well, we're going to make him move that. I mean, if we did what I'm arguing about, I don't know that I'm 100% sold on my argument. I want to hear what my colleagues have to say. But it does seem like a resolution. It seems like a mediated resolution to a problem where somebody is getting away with a little something more maybe than he should. But then again, maybe not. It's my understanding that the Planning Commission staff told him he had several options to be legal. One would be simply to tear out the permanent goals, go back to what he committed to in the first place, or cut concrete. Well, listen, it's, it's obviously the simplest said, would be the appeal. first choice. That, I'm sure that's exactly what staff said, whatever it is you just, how you phrased it. But we're on an appeal process now that is beyond the staff's decision, and we can go any way we decide is advantageous. Unless, if we said to him, you got to put the permanent pole there back where the temporary pole is supposed to be, and you can keep your property, your, your cement. And he says, no, I don't want to move. I want to put keep my permanent pole where it is. We say, okay, case denied, appeal denied, you're not going to get it. So why not just take the path of least resistance? Because... He's, he, he can easily keep the slab there by just making a temporary goal over there. Mm -hmm. And he can keep the slab. What do we care if it's a permanent slab or not? I mean, how does it change? We can't approve it. No, you, because it, it would break. I know. It would, the Homeowners Association has taken the position, and I don't think there's any question. I thought you said we that you were no, going to agree to accept whatever the city council did. We did never said that. Oh, that I'm, was I'm misquoted. Sorry, I, I, what we did, if I may, the city said they had a requirement of 10-foot side setback, 10-foot rear setback. We have 15. Okay. For you know any what? construction, and quite I, frankly, that also includes a air conditioning uh, condenser that includes pool equipment, cannot be within 15 feet of the property line. That's our rules. That's in the CCNRs. Okay. okay. Can we stop here for we just said, about five minutes so we can take a little break and you can come back right back up to the podium and we can continue this? Sure. Okay. Because I don't think any of us want to miss any of this. Uh, and, and, uh, and unless and, unless you're married, and, in which case you'd like to miss it all. <laughs> yes, no. And, uh, and, and if people would like to take a, a five minute break and kind of. Uh, uh, do whatever's necessary and stretch your legs. <laughs> so you'll come back up here, Mr. McCrane, and we'll finish uh, hearing from you. Thank you. Just five minutes.
We're back in session. Uh, Mr. McCrane, if you'd like to come up and resume. And perhaps you can um, start wrapping up your last comments and then we can you know, move on. And, and uh, then that time, maybe Mr. Blue would like to come up and make his comments. Uh, I think you're, uh, Councilman Hobart, you're taking the position that if you moved a permanent goal 10 feet back, that would not make it a sports court anymore, which by your own regulations, it is still. But and I, agree, I agree with what you just said. I don't disagree with that at all. Okay, I would just like to clear up basically one uh, thing that was either misstated or misunderstood. That basically, the Homeowners Association has never said that if the city decided to roll over and approve this, then we would approve it too. We can't without changing our CCNRs, and I'm sure you have some idea of what that takes. Right, and I appreciate you saying Several that. I years. was just under a misunderstanding, that's all. Uh, the reality is we said, when the city said that they only had a 10-foot setback, we had a um, board meeting and decided that in the nature of being a good uh, neighbor, we would meet the city's requirement and waive the additional five feet. I see. So if he met the city's minimum standards, we would approve it. Short of any of that, we cannot approve it. Thank you. I appreciate that clarification. Okay. Unless you have any questions, I'm through. Thank you. Thank you so much for your input and uh, mm -hmm. for coming back up. Okay. Uh, any other speakers in the audience that would like to make comment? Mr. Blue is here. Come on up. Thank you all for listening. Um, first and foremost, um, I wanted to start off and say that staff was, while we weren't always exactly um, in a complete alignment on our opinions and philosophies, um, they were excellent to deal with, professional and consistent. So s your staff was not inconsistent or unclear with me at any time. Again, we may have had a difference of opinion in things, which happens anyway, but um, Jeremy did a great job, as did your others. And again, we weren't even in agreement every time, but I would say that. Second thing is on Mr. McGrain's comments, the, the, the whole reason why I've decided to make this a bigger issue may than maybe all of your time is worth is because of principle. So the idea of what arena am I in, in which am I operating? Am I operating in the Homeowners Association arena or am I operating in the City of Rancho Mirage's arena? The, the inconsistency, nobody's fault, maybe, maybe through this case we can clean up the, the language to help everybody for the future to make it easier, might be helpful, is the setback for the goal versus the setback for the court, which we've obviously talked about at length here today. The city's rule, per se, is uh, that if you have a patio, as we've heard many times, you're fine, and that the Homeowners Association, which I've honored, is that the goal has to be 10 foot back from the property lines, which I've honored with the permanent goals. So I've honored every one of those situations. Um, my decisions were made along the way based on a sequence of events. So I started the process with the Homeowners Association, with Christina, and I did not, and I was not, and I was told that you did not have to have permits for this because we had a pre-existing small, a larger volleyball court that predated my basketball court that was on the site. So I made a smaller basketball court to where a volleyball court was. The um, down-facing landscaping lighting was pre-existing. I did not put that in, so to refute Mr. McCrane's comments that I put lighting in is an incorrect statement, and I think I want the record cleared for that. And as it relates to the Homeowners Association, during the process, midstream during construction, when we were under construction and they stopped us, um, and during the process, I sent a letter to Christina, who represents the Homeowners Association, and I'll read it on January 30th, 2014. Christina, as discussed today, we will now locate the permanent basketball goal on a 10-foot setback from the Clancy Lane property line. I will send the contractors back in the morning. This is when they said, hold on, hold on, you're not 10 feet, and we went back. And she said, Mr. Blue, thank you. 
permanent record, January 31st, et cetera. The last thing I'll just say that's to keep it simple is maybe just for future, so that there can be beneficiaries from this from the future so we can maybe get some rewards out of all this work is that that word sport court, and I've got a gentleman in the back who actually works for sport court, so he won't like that I'm saying this, but maybe take that word sport court out of it, because it might be confusing. And say, if you have a patio, you could have a 10-foot pole in the patio. It could be an umbrella, could be a basketball court, could be anything. Um, and maybe that word sport court maybe should go away, because I think it confused, because you use the examples of you could roller skate on it, you could have a party on it, you could have other things. And lastly, on the goals and the fact that are they better or are they worse than the um, temporary goals? And uh, Mr. Hobart made a good point. In the temporary goals, they would be uh, 10 feet plus all the time, could go all the way to the property line, and quite frankly, according to the law, stay the whole time. My permanent goals go down. You don't see them under my wall from Clancy Lane. They go down and they're much less injurious to the environment, et cetera. And then lastly, just globally as a part of this whole thing, none of these laws I think are that bad because we've never talked about water runoff or any problems that normally, these are just distances between, for the pole, which we've definitely met every rule, and, and distances from the, from the patio, which we've met those rules. It's just, are we operating in the homeowners association? Or are we operating in the city? And, I'm sorry for the misunderstanding. Sorry that we took, took everyone's time, but I do think principle and standards are important in life and you should fight for them if you believe in them. And again, I just want to close and say that, again, even though Jeremy and I went back and forth a lot, I mean, we didn't agree all the time and, and we probably at certain times weren't each other's favorite people. Um, he was consistent and he was honorable and he represented the city of Rancho Mirage very well. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. I have a question, sure. Mr. Blue. When you have the portable goals, do you have to take them in at night or move them? No, you do not. Then what would your objection be to just going to the portables? Because I think the portables are more injurious to the environment because they can stay up That's true. and they can be right against the property line. I think the, the, the law or the rules should be tweaked because the goals that I have go down and are hidden versus or more hidden than a full 10 foot plus goal that can go right up against another person's property. And by the way, the sequence of events that I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. at one time, Jeremy will remember this, we were talking about putting temporary goals in and the temporary goal was against the, my next door neighbor on that side, one of the doctors that was mentioned. And we actually decided against it because when we put the goals lengthwise, they were 10 plus feet from Clancy Lane and. 10 plus feet from my house and everybody else's house. So we thought that would be a better solution. I'm not saying Jeremy agreed with that. I'm just saying that is, was a more favorable solution to the environment and the process and seemed to abide by all the laws. Again, operating in the city's law that you have to have um, a patio and the homeowner association which says your goals must be 10 feet from the property line. You said you worked well with the city how well did you work with the HOA board? Well, I, I, I had a hard time with the HOA. My own homeowners association, then I had a hard time with it, but I relied upon information on January 31st from the homeowners association that said, go ahead. And that's why we proceeded. They so, told you to go ahead? Well, she said, I said, again, I'll reiterate, Christina, as discussed today, we will now locate the permanent basketball goal on a 10 foot setback from the Clancy Lane property line. I will send the contractors back in the morning. Thank you. She said, Mr. Blue, thank you. Not stop, don't do it, <laughs> whatever else. So, and, and I, uh, so I'll leave it at that. Yeah, the, 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 as you can appreciate, <clears throat> that's kind of ambiguous as far as her response is concerned. Um, you know, from, as a businessman, I say, was she thanking you for your courtesy in <laughs> acknowledging her letter or was she saying, thanks very much, proceed? You know, there, there is that ambiguity there, which obviously is the reason for this debate. Totally agree, and, and um, I would say that, again, I am within the rules of the, of the Mission Ranch Homeowner Association to have those goals 10 feet from the property line. And there were discussions that said, just so you know, absolutely, that said, if the city blesses it, we're good. Those discussions absolutely happened. Now, that's neither here nor there. 
The fact is, I'm 10 feet, those goals are 10 feet from the property line, which is the only rule that the Homeowners Association of Rancho Mirage has, and I've honored that. Now the issue is in the city, this patio issue sport court. Is it a patio? Is it a sport court? That, I think, is the city's issue. The 10 feet goals, that's, the homeowner says they're 10 feet. I agree with you as far as the um, terminology on sports court is concerned. You'll get no credit for having that change in the future. <laughs> There'll be no notation, but I think the point is well taken there. Yeah. I think that does require clarification. Yeah. Uh, however, that still doesn't remedy the existing uh, issue. And just in closing, I mean, you know, I'm new to town. I don't want to be a, a bad neighbor. I think the court we put in is, you know, the, the court is green, the grass is green, it goes away. There was a, one of the slides, if Jeremy could put it back up, the very first slide shows the volleyball court, which was a totally different color, which was larger, which was, quite frankly, you know, sand was blowing everywhere. There was big posts with lights on the posts that were, that were brought down. I mean, I, I thought we improved it. And if you look at that picture, in that bottom right hand corner of the red outlines, that's a, a big, white, larger volleyball court with lights that were up that came out. The landscaping lighting remained. I did not remove those. I didn't think I have to remove landscape lighting. And then that picture turned to a green court that is much more environmentally conscious and much more pleasing to the eye, I guess I'll say in my opinion, but probably in most people's opinion. So I don't, I don't understand the reason for the fight. <clears throat> Mr. Ballou, the um, portion of the slab that is within the 10 feet of, yep. of your neighbor's property line or Clancy Lane, whichever, <clears throat> is that slab that you put in or is that part of the vo volleyball slab? Great question. So the slab, again, from the homeowner's perspective, is within the 10 feet, but that is not a homeowner's violation. So that would kick it over to the city, which would say, is it a patio or is it a sport court? And you know, if you want to get real legal, you could unscrew those <coughs> goals and are they temporary or are they permanent? I mean, I'm uh, being a little bit facetious, but um, the bottom line is the homeowners association um, only has jurisdiction in their bylaws that he mentioned over the 10 feet of the goalposts. It's the city's that's the slab, which again, if you had that clarification on sport court versus patio, it allows a patio. You can pave your entire backyard, which I've, and I've got a lot of grass that I water every day and keep environmentally conscious and all that kind of stuff. But so I just think it's a nuance that we got, kind of got tripped up on. And, um, but but I, again, I think we've operated within the law in each of the arenas that we've, that we've placed ourselves. The answer to my question is, it's volleyball or it's new slab? So the volleyball court was sand and it was larger. It was sand? Yes, sir. It was sand. Oh, I thought, it was, I thought you said it was uh, cement. No, the volleyball court was sand and larger. And then we put the slab patio in gotcha. after. OK. Thank right. you very much. Thank you very time. much. OK. Thank you very much. And somebody else would like to speak? Good afternoon, my name is Jeff Miller and I am a neighbor and I was a previous board uh, member. Um, I did write a letter that's in your packet and uh, although I have no impact to this court, I'm not adjacent to it, I do want the precedent set and I do understand our CCNRs that it's not the goalpost that has to be within, it's the permanent structure. It's the entire sports court. The sports court is three feet from the wall or 3.22. The goalpost may be in, but the court is right next to the neighbors. And the one thing I don't want, because I, I have a nice home there too, and I do want to protect that my next door neighbor does not build a structure, a permanent structure, up against my wall. And that's why I wrote the letter. So I did want to clarify that everyone keeps on saying goalpost <coughs> or whatever it is. It's the, the sports court itself that is inside the uh, easements that is um, that I'm against. Okay. So, if I understand what you're saying, the you're counting the slab as a structure. It's a permanent structure with the uh, attachments to it. Yes, you're, sir. You're not referring to the the poles themselves. You're no, actually referring. It's the permanent structure. It's the entire court that is within the easements of our CCNRs, and I don't want something built 
up against my wall of my home. Um, Richard, on page 24, it shows the diagram <coughs> of the entire court right. being three feet, the entire slab being right. three feet. Right. You know, there's a couple, thank you so much. Thank you, you very want much. To continue? Okay. There's a couple of things that bother me and um, and the fact that this, whether you call it a sports court or you, you call it a patio or whatever it is and you use it for roller skating or you use it for entertaining or use it for basketball, um, there's a certain amount of noise that comes from basketballs being bounced uh, on a hard surface, number one. But more than that, I remember in junior high and high school playing basketball and being hit in the head with a basketball. Um, I believe that there have been a couple people that have mentioned that the balls have come over the fence. I would feel terrible if there was a child sitting there playing on the neighbor's grass or whatever happened to be next door and got hit in the head with a basketball. Um, I don't know if that's something we need to consider or if it's irrelevant, but I think it's something that I would consider. And I, I think rules are made because of certain ramifications or certain requirements. I think certain rules should be clarified. I think certain rules sometimes need to be changed. But that's something that the homeowner association needs to deal with, and that's something that maybe our city needs to deal with, and maybe something that um, we need to clarify. Um, so um, now that our hearing, I mean, our, now that if there's anybody else that has anything to say, since we are closing the public comments. Um, maybe we could discuss this a little further and see what other people's comments are and do we go back, let it go back to the Homeowner Association or do we just um, try to mitigate it in whatever way possible? Because um, there are a couple of issues Well, it here. seems to me like the uh, ho being in a Homeowners Association, being on a board of a Homeowners Association and going through issues right now that we are going through a desert landscaping all the advice and everything from attorneys that have come to us are that the HOA is in control. And you can't go against what the HOA is unless, as he said, you change the CC&Rs. That's what they're there for. And if we approve this, a precedent would be set. But does the Homeowners Association have to pay any attention to what we're doing? Can they just go back to him and say, I don't care what they said, you still have to do what we are saying and what's in our CCNRs. That's where I'm at with it. Ted, did you have something? Yeah. Um, I would, uh, Madam Mayor, I'd, I'd like the public comment uh, reopened for a moment because I'd like to direct, direct uh, a question to Mr. <coughs> Blue, if you would. I'd like to ask him to come back up for a moment. Okay. Well, we'll reopen the public comments. Mr. Blue, it, obviously there's a quandary here. We're dealing with terminology and we're trying to also be practical. I think I understand where you're coming from. I, by the way, I lived on Clancy Lane a long time myself. But that's neither here nor there. If if you were willing to saw cut seven feet, or not even seven, is it six? No, six or seven. Um, and that would clarify the setback. Irrespective of the ambiguity, whether the interpretation and all those things. Your baskets would remain permanent, and unless I'm missing something, that would be satisfactory with the HOA, unless I'm wrong, because it would satisfy the setback requirement. It's not exactly what you want. Now, I understand that. You're taking part of the slab away. On the other hand, you're not shortening the cord either. Um, yeah, you drive for a basket and you end up <clears throat> on dirt or something. In the wall. Well, but the wall's there there now. 
I mean, um, you're, not, you're not changing the wall. The wall's right. there right now. Right. It just seems to me uh, that that would be a potential solution, should you be willing, because obviously the HOA is, and I believe the city would be satisfied. Uh, so my question to you is, would that be an acceptable solution? Uh, before I can answer that question, it probably wouldn't, and here's the reason. Would or would I, not? I would not. Would not. Here's the reason. I don't understand what does the HOA want? What, what do you want? You just want the basketball court gone, right? Because you think it's a structure? Is that what you said? Because we can take the permanent goals out. I'm not going to do that, by the way. And then is, are you acceptable then? We'll have the movable goals. Is that what you would want? Yes. Well, you know what? Instead of you speaking to right, okay. So, so the answer is I can't answer your question because I don't know where the HOA stands. It sounds like they're trying to stop me in every direction. First of all, no basketball has yeah. gone over. No basketball has ever gone over the landscape wall into the other yard. Not once. So that must have been another yard. The other thing is, when I moved into the neighborhood, I was told that the HOA was upset that there were basketball court courts on driveways in front yards, and they didn't like the way that looked. So I spent the money to hide it and put it in my backyard and thought I was respecting my personal property rights and did it in a very nice way, which doesn't affect anybody else in the world. Um, and I did the 10-foot goal setbacks, and I did the patio, and I thought I did everything right. And I'm just kind of wondering why I'm getting trying to get caught in every direction when it seems like I've checked every box. If, <clears throat> and obviously we're trying to. I know, I know come to an agreement between the two. I'm not a mediator. There is somebody on this panel that is. However, uh, if the HOA said yes, if Mr. Blue would cut that slab to seven feet, your baskets are permanent, they would agree to it, the city would agree to it, and the issue was settled, would that be something no, you? I would not do that. Because what I would do before that, which again, I'm not agreeing to do, is I would take the permanent goals out and put temporary goals in, but I believe they will lose and the neighborhood will lose because the temporary goals will be closer per the CCNRs that supposedly are so immovable. Um, the temporary goals will be up against the property lines and they'll be 10 foot sticking out over the wall in Clancy Lane versus a hidden permanent goal that goes down and out of sight. So, so what I would do is I would take the route of no, saying no to answer your question and I would move toward, I guess they would, I'm trying to wonder, I guess they would then say, your goals are permanent and that's acceptable and now they're going to do whatever they're gonna do. I guess in your, I'm trying to understand, I'm in the city of Rancho Mirage and what am I applying for in the city of Rancho Mirage versus the homeowners association? I think we're all kind of confused by that. And I thought I've satisfied both, but I've satisfied both in separate arenas. And today was a day to, to what I thought to bring a clarity and explanation of why the sequence of events led to this situation. Because Jeremy will tell you that we started the process with a patio with temporary goal, with a temporary goal that was against the other neighbor's wall that we decided against because it was not acceptable. And so we said, let's just get 10 feet from everybody, which we thought checked the box, and then I got Christina's, again, whether I interpreted that way or not, she didn't say don't go forward. Um, and so the answer to your question, and so I don't want to waste anybody more time, is, is no, at this point right now, I would not agree to cut that slab because the slab without the goals is acceptable according to the city of Rancho Mirage, and okay. the goals separate from the slab is acceptable to the homeowners association. Okay. okay. All right. You know, I understand your position. Uh, our position is trying to satisfy right. the majority of our residents to the best of our abilities. I, and I, I just didn't, I, and I know I'm not supposed to speak to them. I don't understand what the Homeowners Association is so upset about. The rules, the CCNRs win. Again, my kids have played basketball there three times. The lights have been on twice. This is in eight months. Those lights, by the way, were already there. Why wasn't this dealt with with the CCNR and the volleyball court? What happened with that? 
So anyway, that's just a factual well, things that are relevant. I'm wondering what's going on with me versus the previous situation. All right, thank you for, for the answer. Scott. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Todd. Todd. Um, I, I was really a little bit confused with your conversation with Jeremy. You said you understood his position, but you didn't agree with it all. I mean, his position was what the city's position Yeah, is. and I honored the city's position. So to be clear, we said, and, and, and again, Mr. Um, McCray Lowell um, said, um, we were definitely told that by the, the, the Homeowners Association, Gary Whitaker and other people that sit on the board, that we'll accept it if the city blesses it. So then I went with Jeremy down a pathway, which by the way, relied upon information from Christina at the Homeowners Association that said that those 10 foot goals, she didn't, she didn't say that that was unacceptable. And so then we had the patio. So, so again, when I say with Jeremy, I was complimenting Jeremy because he was not ever disrespectful. He was honoring the rules and the, the, he gave me ideas and advice. We, we, we went back and forth with each of those and we agreed to disagree on certain things, but um, he could see where the, our struggle all along was, does this belong in the city of Rancho Mirage or does it belong in the Homeowners Association's hands? And when you built the courts, you were building them with the understanding that you were doing what the city asked you to do? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Steve, you, would you like to make some? You know, um, first of all, there's no definition of what a sports court is. Right. But it sounds like, the, based on the interpretation of staff, if you were able to unscrew those goal posts, pull them out, put them in the garage, they technically would be mobile and not affixed. Technically, then yeah, you if you want to get technical. To move back, you wouldn't have to cut back the concrete. I mean, is that my understanding? He was able to remove those, unscrew them, pick them up, and I've got the, the gentleman garage. from Sport Court here that could tell you that. But again, for full disclosure, yes, you could no, remove them and do that. Okay. But who wants to do that? We can put them down, and they're out of the way. Versus a temporary goal, temporary in quotes, that can be rolled away. But according to the law, you can leave in place, and it's visible to everyone. Where mine is not visible. But it's a good point you make. Todd, what's the difference in the height? In, in, a, in a temporary goal that would be there the whole time? Right. So that would be 10 feet plus, you know, call it six feet of backboard, so 16 plus feet that would be seen from Clancy Lane versus my goal that rolls down that probably would be a total of nine feet at the top of the backboard when it's pushed down, which is at or underneath the top of the landscape wall. Okay, so while you're playing, the height is no different. Well, you raise it up while you're playing, and you, and you, you put it down just as you would, by the way, with a temporary goal, right? You're going to play on a full-size goal um, when you play basketball, unless you want to have your kids play dunk basketball on the low goals or something, which is fine. So you both both goals go up and down. Um, the temporary goals, um, arguably, I don't know if they go up or down, but I, I probably could buy some that could, but... Uh, again, there would be no protection to the Homeowners Association if those goals went down or not. You wouldn't be, according to the CCNR that's so immovable, you would not be allowed to be forced to buy temporary goals that were pushed down. And again, I think the court that we built is, I, I'm just wondering what, what the problem is with the Homeowners Association other than the CCNR situation, which again, dictates the goal and I, is the basketball court a structure? and what denotes a structure. That's new information to, the, to me today that a basketball court is a structure. Did you understand why the Planning Commission rejected your appeal? Um, I, as I understand it from Jeremy, he had to reject it because he was interpreting the law because of the sport court language versus patio. Anything okay. else? And when you came to the city, mm -hmm. did you come with the idea of building a patio? 
Well, my or kids roller skate and skateboard, and did, we have parties on it all the time. So what denotes a sport court and what denotes a patio? Well, okay. <coughs> Todd, do you think if uh, you were able to sit down with the board over at uh, your HOA that you could come to some sort of an agreement on what they would require? I, would, would, I would really hope so. I've, I've tried to ask them many times to come to their meetings. They've never been able to move them. Um, so I think we should do that. I think that would be great. I, I mean, I think that obviously I've abided by the laws of the city. And so now, again, what arena are we in? Are we in the city? Today I know we are. Um, and where are we with the Homeowners Association? Okay. All right. Thank you so Thank much you. for all your input. Thanks. And we will now close the public hearing. Okay. And Paris. Oh, okay. You want to come back? And uh, this is Mr. Crane, McCrane again. I'd like to just clear up a couple of things. Number one, um, I would direct your attention to section 17.30.230 of your uh, code. And chapter 1748 refers no tennis courts or sports courts. And basically sports courts are pretty well universally understood as a basketball court, uh, shall be located closer than 10 feet to the nearest property line. That's your rule, not ours. Um, as far as Mr. Blue's question, what would the, you know, that we wouldn't be happy with anything, we want him to tear his court out, uh, that's absolutely incorrect, to use a nicer word than I'd like to use. We don't care if he has a basketball court. We don't care if he has a sports court, as long as it's built legally and is permitted. We would be happy and we would accept if he saw a cut back to where he should have been in the first place for 10 feet, because your own regulation doesn't say anything about where the goal is. It says sports court, specifically to hold the noise away from the neighbors. Um, we would be happy and sign off on it if he saw a cut at two existing required minimum setback. We would also be happy if he left it right where it is and put in legal, and they are collapsible by the way, portable goals. We'll sign off on either one of them. I'm the vice president of the association. That's it. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you, you so much. Now we're, yes? <coughs> No, okay, no. well, if, as long as there's no one else that wants to come up and speak, we'll close the public session. Uh, is there anyone else on the uh, council that would like to make comment? Richard? Oh, Madam Mayor, I, I think we have an opportunity here uh, that maybe the parties can get together and resolve this issue. Uh, so what I would like to recommend or move is that we continue this item to the next date in the future and uh, allow the two parties to get together and see if they can resolve this issue. Okay, you're talking about the, the next. Okay, yeah. second meeting. Let's do it. Second meeting soon. Yeah, and that'll give them almost a month to uh, discuss it and see if they can come up with something. That and uh, maybe we can have Jeremy involved in that meeting too to just clarify the city's position. Okay, Jeremy, that sounds good. Yeah. That'll be fine with me, absolutely. Okay. I'll All second. Right. I'll second the motion. Okay. So everyone, please vote. Okay. Motion carries five zero. Thank you so much. And uh, we will now move on to the next item on the agenda, which is something that's going to be taken care. Of. No. Okay, this is item number 15, and uh, it will be addressed by our associate planner, Greg Tuesdale. Well, good afternoon, uh, Madam Mayor and uh, Council Members. Uh, CUP04 is a telecom facility proposed at the Highway 111 fire station facility uh, for the Verizon Wireless Company. It's an unmanned facility. The uh, city fire station is located at 7801 Highway 111 on a two acre parcel abutting the Thunderbird Heights development. Uh, there are three existing homes behind the property that front onto 
uh, Boot Hill Road. As proposed, the 1,000 square foot lease area is 120 feet northeast of the fire station building. The 60 foot high monopalm antenna is planned uh, abutting the existing uh, 19 foot wide service driveway. Uh, the antenna is about 128 feet from High 111 and 54 feet from the uh, rear yard wall. Uh, slide four shows the lease site, which includes a 195 square foot, one story prefab building, an emergency generator, the monopalm, and an eight foot high uh, masonry wall. The height of the building is 10 foot six, which is 2.5 feet higher uh, than the wall itself. Uh, the right hand side of the slide shows the top view of the monopalm with the antenna array and the, fox and the uh, fake uh, palm fronds. Uh, condition seven requires the uh, standoffs to be three feet from the monopalm pole in order to bring the antennas closer to the monopalm for better screening. Uh, site six provides uh, elevation views of the monopalm and the live palm trees. Uh, pursuant to the Planning Commission meeting, uh, condition 20E, a total of four California fan palms are needed to screen the uh, antenna array. And adjacent to that are existing 40 foot high jacaranda trees. Uh, the left side the slide shows the view from High 111. Um, as mentioned in the report, a uh, second wireless provider uh, will, can be involved with this, so we did show that, uh, and those antennas would be inside the trunk itself. Uh, this was the uh, photo of the um, materials board, so you can see the various materials, the, uh, the proposed bark, Pebble Tech exterior. Um, so these are standards for a monopalm type facility. Um, for monopalm, staff asks that the applicant provide photo simulations. So this is um, basically north, looking northwest from Highway 111. Uh, this slide um, from Highway 111. Uh, next one is basically behind the project, looking from uh, the boot hill inside the uh, Thunderbird Palms development. Uh, this side would be from the opposite uh, direction. If you came in from Thunderbird Road uh, at the signal using the uh, existing uh, driveway, so you're looking towards the uh, fire station. I went ahead and took a picture of the existing palm that's located at the Children's Discovery Museum because uh, it's a similar type design, although this one has some upgrades to it, but that's the one that uh, was uh, built, I believe, uh, last year. Um, SmartLink conducted an outreach program with the homeowners of Thunderbird Heights in September 2013. This was the flyer, so it's in your package. Uh, at that time, they were showing um, live palm trees, as noted in the report. Um, so that was what they uh, saw in their flyer. Um, since that time, there have been some minor modifications, so the conditions reflect some minor changes, but it's still consistent. And I did, uh, on a couple different occasions, keep the HOA apprised of what was going on, as well as the Planning Commission meeting, and they have endorsed the uh, proposed conditions uh, as provided in your packet. The uh, Planning Commission reviewed the project on August 14th. Um, we had the open forum. Uh, nobody spoke against the project, just the applicant spoke. Uh, that testimony is in your packet in the minutes. Um, therefore, um, based on the Planning Commission's recommendation, you have before you recommendation for approval with the findings and conditions, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay. Uh, Greg, if I have a couple questions. Uh, the, the picture you had of the Children's Museum, um, palm, mono palm, mm -hmm. did that have the additional fronds uh, added to it, or was that the normal amount? Because I think we talked about having additional fronds. You're correct. Actually, I've done a lot of research on it. Um, traditionally, you're looking for 60 to 80 um, to really provide a, a good cover. So what I did on this particular one is the, um, a lot of times, like you can see this exhibit, that the vertical antennas, they usually like to keep them out about five feet from the monopalm itself. And the research I found is um, they can do it down to three feet. So 
what I did in this one was try to push them back towards the pole. Normally they do 10 foot fronds, and you're correct, we're asking them to definitely, um, so at the last meeting they said they could put the um, antennas closer to the monopalm at three feet, and yes, they would put in more fronds to uh, disguise the uh, antenna array, so you're correct. That's what we're hoping to get a better one than this one that's proposed, the one that was built, I guess. And that uh, condition number seven, right, Greg? The standoffs was number seven, yes. Okay. Uh, also, this uh, Barbara uh, Sato from Sh SmartLink had mentioned that um, uh, should a second wireless provider want to use the uh, monopalm antenna, the city of Rancho Mirage will need to lease that new provider a site so that they too can install an electric building with a support generator. How much space does a generator need? Well, actually, what uh, what she was conveying um, to the city, and she's correct, um, uh, their lease arrangement is for that thousand square feet. So she was indicating that because our code encourages co-location, she's saying we'd have to lease next door to it another thousand square feet, so that that other provider could have its own facility and building generator, et cetera, but they, they would have access to the monopomp. So she's just clarifying that, that the second provider is not going to come in and use their building. That's, that's not the intent. So she's just making that clear, and that, that would be um, a normal situation. The, the problem we've had is that this, kind of, this new concept that we've been trying to um, make happen, um, to date, we really don't have any monopalms that have dual service on it. So this one, um, if it's built um, per the lease agreement and approved today, would be the first one. Um, they, they put the pole up, provide the, um, so on the pole itself, I think the, the antennas were shown at 40 to 60, 60, uh, 46 feet, and those would be inside the um, monopalm for the other provider. But the city would have to sign another lease with another provider for an adjacent site for their facilities. Okay, and do we have a space available adjacent? Yes, we do. Okay, would we have to purchase that? And Actually, they would have to come before so you with a separate lease agreement okay. showing where, they, where their preference would be. And then, um, as we did on this one, we asked the facilities director to examine the site, make sure they were happy with where the facility was, fire personnel, since it was across the driveway, they were okay with it. So I'd, I'd venture to say that it would probably be to the west of this proposed area for a possible another uh, equipment building. That would be my guess. Because okay. the nice part is you have that existing wall on I-111 that already exists, the meandering wall with the landscaping. And so that's kind of why Verizon, um, well, SmartLink and Verizon, picked behind the wall by the service road so it can't be seen from the street. Okay, all right, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Greg, uh, I'm not sure whether you covered it or not, but did you discuss any kind of maintenance on the site? The, um, the maintenance, it's, you mean for, the, for their building and their lease area or for the pole or? Any additional maintenance that's required, uh, landscaping, any uh, requirements such as that? Are, are we uh, being asked to cover that, or are they going to cover that? Or? Actually, the, um, it's gone back and forth. The, the last thing I saw, because it's supposed to be buttoned up when the final lease is signed, currently they're required to maintain everything unless they, um, and that's the, the legal department, with the city manager's office um, provides, because there has been some discussion on the on the maintenance of the the uh, live palm trees, so it'll be up to the final lease agreement to determine if if we do help them in any way, such as just charging them. One of the ideas was since the city has to pay for tree maintenance, um, one idea would be is that the city at the same time would maintain their palms and back charge them for that fee. That was discussed, um, but the final lease would, would, would clarify that uh, in its entirety. So it's been discussed. That's, that's, the only, that's the only thing that would be discussed. Everything else they have to maintain, the pole, 
the uh, building, uh, anything inside the uh, lease area, uh, they have to maintain everything. Okay, thank you. Okay. Does that help? Okay, Bruce, would you like to? Yeah, Greg, I just wanted to confirm, does this approval include the rerouting of the conduits that I requested on their map that I work with Robert on, city attorney's office? They included those exhibits, and uh, I think they're including those in the lease agreement. Okay. And then with a, with a co, um, possibly another carrier, um, will they co-locate in the same locations for electric power? I mean, I'm wondering if we can get them to put some additional conduits in the ground so we don't have to tear up the road another time if there is a, another carrier that goes in there. Do you think they'd be willing to do but that? But it's true, the run, the, run, the run that they were proposing was, you're right, it, it was some 500 feet around the, the back station. of the building. So it was quite a, quite a length of, uh, I mean, that was their preferred alternative. Um, I guess you could ask uh, Barbara's here to represent uh, Verizon. Uh, it probably makes sense. I would think maybe they would install it now, because you're right, it would make uh, sense, and then, uh, um, then I guess we could uh, back charge the uh, future provider on that additional cost. Yeah, really just the putting of the conduit in is very minimal when you have the trench open, but it does get disruptive right. to the fire station if someone's going to have to go back in there a second time and reopen the trench. And That's true. Okay. Any other questions? Any questions from the audience? Public hearing now is now open. If you, somebody would like to come and speak, this is Barbara uh, Set Sato. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon. My name is Barbara Sato. <coughs> I live in Walnut, California. Uh, I'm representing Verizon today. Um, Greg has been pretty thorough in a staff report, and, I'm, and the staff report itself was, was pretty lengthy, so I won't <coughs> regurgitate that to you. But I did want to address uh, a couple of the items that you just brought up. Um, first, about the picture of the palm tree that Greg took and the fronds. Um, Greg, I don't know about that particular palm tree, whether it was a Verizon uh, facility or not. Each carrier uses uh, has a variety of um, manufacturers who create these trees. Um, so I can't speak to that particular one. However, uh, the manufacturer that um, Verizon uses has a um, feature that if, you, if you've ever paid attention to these uh, trees, um, they've got a triangle that holds the antennas in place, and it's got a horizontal bar that holds the antennas in a vertical bar that actually the antennas are installed on. This manufacturer can put some fronds on those horizontal bars that will also extend the, the fronds beyond <coughs> the, the face of the antennas. Uh, so by bringing the antennas back and then putting these, not only the, the, the 60 to 80 number of palm fronds, plus these additional fronds, it'll have a really uh, a natural look because the fronds all grow at different lengths anyway, and screen the antennas a little bit better than uh, what that particular one had. Uh, and that's would be our recommendation to uh, to Verizon to do that, to tell their, uh, their manufacturer to do so. Okay. Um, got to remember all your questions. Um, the, the, <coughs> the maintenance, the maintenance, the maintenance. Uh, the maintenance is uh, typically, typically um, landscaping is uh, taken care of by the landowner. The reason is, is that the uh, sprinklers are all hooked up to the the landowner's sprinkler system as opposed to Verizon coming in and putting in its own water meter and sprinkle system. With that said, that is uh, part of the lease agreement and I believe that the discussions have been for the city to do the maintenance of the, the, the live trees um, because there's a synergy into doing all the landscaping at one time as opposed to you know a second uh, uh, mans landscape company coming in and doing it. But it is it is part of the lease and and wasn't addressed in our in our zoning application. Would you agree to us maintaining the area and then charging you back? On them? Um, <coughs> I can't personally agree to that. There's uh, my associate is the one who works with the city and the city manager's office to to do that. Um, but it's certainly on the table to have the discussion about. Thank you. Um, Maintenance. Oh, the second carrier. 
when we build these facilities, um, you can see that on a regular palm tree, monopalm, we have the antennas on the outside, and there's 12 of them, and they're about a nine foot um, side to a triangle. When a second carrier comes in on a palm tree, they need to pay, be able to install their antennas within the trunk of the, the palm in order to make it more, look more natural. There's, you, I'm sure you've seen plenty as you've driven around where they've attached the antennas to the outside of the uh, palm tree. That can still be done. Uh, you know, that's something that's agreeable to the city at a later date. certainly can happen. Um, there is a limited amount of space inside this trunk, so not every carrier can put every single antenna inside this trunk. Uh, the remedy for that is if a carrier comes, has an express interest, wants to do this particular design, and their antennas don't fit, the pole can be removed and a second pole can be installed that would have a, have a much, larger, mar, much larger girth and be able to put the, the antennas in there. There are antennas that will fit in this tree, but I can't speak to when the, the carrier would come, what antennas are available, and uh, what will happen at that point, if, 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 if the occasion even arises. Um, but it is being designed to have the, uh, that part of the trunk being manufactured out of RF uh, transparent material, so the antennas would operate inside of the trunk. Is there any other questions? Oh, you asked about the uh, conduits. Um, I would throw those to the lease also, and uh, that would be great. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Yes, I do. Uh, what is your time frame for commencing construction if uh, on this particular permit? So we, uh, once I leave here, I'll be able to tell the um, tell Verizon exactly what we've got approved, and uh, we can start putting together the construction drawings. And which means we have to order the tree, get the manufacturer's uh, information, and be able to submit for plan check. Um, at the same time, the lease has to be finalized, and it will also be coming to you at a public hearing. I don't think that's been, I don't know which department handles that. So I don't think that's been scheduled for actually, hearing. Actually, actually, the lease was approved in April, and the final workings just go to the city attorney and um, Randy Binder, the city manager. Oh, okay. So the terms have, be have, been, have been preset with some minor allowances. Okay. Um, so if we could get the, the building permit and the lease finalized, uh, we would like to start before the end of the year. After that point, I can't say. You would do that forthwith? Is that what you're saying? Yes. The problem that we have had in the past, <clears throat> whether it be with Her Verizon or anyone else, as you can appreciate, as we, we go through the process, uh, permits are issued, and then nothing is done. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have done that. I don't know how many permits we have now uh, out uh, that are scheduled to expire, but it's many. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that there's one person sitting up here on the dais who has not received Numerous complaints, as you as you know from our residents, about cell reception. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, in order to defend the city properly, we have to explain that we have approved a number of permits, but the telephone companies have not followed through and completed the construction. So I, for one, uh, am troubled with having a 12-month period to, uh, as it says in here, uh, approval uh, shall be effective for one year after final action by the city council. From a personal standpoint, I think that's too long, and I think that six months is appropriate based upon what you've also confirmed is that you're ready to go. I see no reason to have 12 months because all it does is languish there. And so, um, from a personal standpoint, I think the time frame is incorrect if we to, were to go ahead and approve the permit. Um, I believe that the time frame is associated with any conditional use permit that's approved. Is, is that right, Greg? I don't think that was particular to uh, the, this cell site or cell sites in particular. Uh, it's a standard condition is correct. 
Um, and actually, I think you, you have some timelines in your final lease agreement that are less than that. Mm -hmm. so, so in this instance, I think the, uh, the, the lease would be the driving, uh, would drive the time frame. Um, but I do want to address your, your larger statement about approving permits and then cell sites not being built. Okay, just before you answer the larger question, Greg, do you see a problem with six months versus 12 months? Well, if the, because um, with your final lease, if they don't perform, uh, the lease expires and that basically expires the use permit because they'd have to come back before. But, I mean, to me, I'd leave the year in um, because they may have some problems, but um, the lease could expire and that expires their use permit unless they get uh, a new reauthorization from council. So they're kind of, they're, because it's a city site, um, and I think that was the original intent of the, some of the discussions with the um, lease agreement was, um, and you're right, because about 40% get built, 60% don't get built. Um, that was one of the terms. So the, the council said, you need to go through the CUP process, and then I believe it said 180 days to build right. it, is my recollection. Thank you, Greg. There's a lot of reasons uh, to go forward on a cell site or to not go forward on a cell site. Uh, there, I, I, don't, I can't speak to every single one that you've approved that hasn't been built. I, will, I do know that I have had sites approved in the city that when I walked away that the conditions were so onerous that even though I accepted them at the time, uh, the, the carrier said, we're not going to do that. That's too much money. We don't want to build it. It's not, it's not worth it to us. And let the, the permit expire. There's other ones where I mentioned, you know, if, if, if I can get this built by the end of, if I can get construction by the end of the year, I'll start going. Um, the carrier's pocketbooks are like anybody else's. We have a budget that we run on. When the money's gone, the money's gone. So the money that they've allotted for this year, those are the projects they're going to build. If the, the projects that don't get their approvals in the necessary, and I'm using a year as the end of the year as, a, as an example. I don't know exactly when the date is. But if the projects that don't get built in that time frame for that bucket of money, they won't be built. They may come up to, well, a year from now before the conditional use permit expires and, you know, apply for a building permit at that time because another bucket of money came up. Or it could be that um, they relook at everything and see which sites they got on air. So this is a different reason. Which sites do we get on air? Which sites do we still need on air? And since we've brought these new ones up, how does that affect the sites that did not get built? Because when they're doing their planning, it's all done by modeling. And models are great, but they're not 100% perfect. Uh, models don't take, they, they take the topography into consideration, but they don't take that topology into consideration, which is all the tall trees, any buildings that get built, things that happen between now mm -hmm. and then, and all of that. So it, it, it's an art. It's not a science. Excuse me. Science. Excuse me. You've answered the question. I mean, you can't just keep talking. I'm sorry. I, I want to ask you a question. You said that there have been times in the past when we have given you permission, granted permission, but we've, there have been, the conditions were so onerous that uh, the company decided mm -hmm. not to uh, pr process it. Yes. Would you give me a copy of every letter that you have sent to us notifying us of that fact that the company I don't found believe the letter's ever been sent over to you. I don't think so either. So you're saying it now, but there is no evidence to support it, and you sat on it all that time. I, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm speaking about, I was asked a question about why a cell company wouldn't build it. I'm not speaking I understand for, what you were asking. I'm not speaking asked, for Verizon in that case. I'm only picking at a point of what mm -hmm. you said. Mm -hmm. I'd like to know why you haven't notified us, say we can't do it, these are the reasons we can't, uh, goodbye. Not once have you ever done that. I don't, you know what, I don't know that well, it carries every day. Yeah. Uh, well, okay. Uh, okay. Anyway, I've said all I have to say, so. All right, Ted, did you want to continue on? No, not at this time. Okay. Um, obviously, there's, this is a, a situation that we've come up against as far as things being approved and not being built. Mm -hmm. Our residents are not happy about it. Uh, we feel that we've wasted a lot of time 
uh, waiting for these things to be built, and they have fallen by the wayside and they have expired. Uh, I wanted to mention to uh, Greg and ask him maybe, um, we have at this point, we can see on page 1531, um, 21 that have been approved and constructed. We have uh, 11 that have been approved, never constructed, and have expired. Uh, we have two pending. Um, how much more do, do we need to really satisfy the need in our immediate city? Would you estimate, or maybe Randy can answer that? How many do we need? How many more do we need? We've, we've got quite a few. I, I, I'm sorry, I would hesitate to say that an RF engineer could answer that just because of the change in technology. I mean, if I would have stood before you five years ago, I wouldn't have been able to foresee the, uh, the demand and capacity that's necessary today. But we have specific areas where, where we're having terrible problems mm -hmm. with reception. Sure, and it's, it's, um, it, it goes to the lay of the land, uh, the, the hills and dips and valleys and, and all of that. Right. Um, and the fact that there's a lot of residential areas. Okay. So as 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 the technology is, evolves and becomes more, a lot of times, not today, and not on this project, I have uh, I've had huge turns out, turnouts by uh, a population okay. that said we don't want this in our neighborhood. Okay. Um, and that and that has been in I, I've had people say that in Rancho Mirage also. Oh, I can't remember exactly which project it was, because they didn't want it in their neighborhoods. People are gradually accepting this to be in their neighborhoods. There's different designs that are being used that are worked in, out in the right of way. So there is a lot of change in technology. Okay. Um, so you're saying that that um, you think that this project is, is is this a go? I mean, for with what my what, understanding what, is, this one's a go. Okay. And what would preclude it from being a go? A go. Y you know, if if. I mean, are you going to go back and say, you know, this is what the city, city has approved. This is what they're ex willing to accept. When are we going to start with this? Uh, I don't want to project something that would not happen, but I will say okay. that there has been times that any particular carrier has gotten caught up in a, uh, a buyout or a sell-off or, you know, a merger and things stop. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for that answer, and I think that Ted... Did you want to uh, continue with something? We're, we're going to close no, the public. When, when, when you're concluded, I will. Uh, okay. Thank you so much for all the information. Okay. And we'll close the uh, Thank you. public comments and hearing. No, I, uh, unless there's further comment, I will be happy to make a motion um, incorporating my. Uh, uh, my prior comment about the time frame. Okay. Unless one of my colleagues has what addition. Was, what was your prior uh, the, the comment will be if, uh, if the motion is made to reduce the, um, uh, the time, basically it's on 1512, the approval to be effective for six months as opposed to one year. That's condition number one. And that's based upon, uh, uh, as I as I mentioned, not to be redundant, the number of permits that have been issued without a follow through. I'll second the motion. Okay. All right. Please vote. Okay. Motion carries five zero. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, well, we'll move on to item number 16, and this is uh, consideration of environmental assessment case, and will be handled by Bud Kopp, our AICP planner manager. Thank you, Mayor Smutrich, and good afternoon, council members. Um, do we have a slide presentation?
Okay, the, the purpose of the hazard mitigation, the purpose of hazard mitigation planning is to identify policies and actions that can be implemented over the long term to reduce risk and future losses. Mitigation plans form the foundation of the city's long-term strategy to reduce disaster losses and break the cycle of disaster damage, reconstruction, and repeated damage. The Federal Disaster Mitigation Act of 2000 requires local governments to adopt a comprehensive hazard mitigation plan in order to receive pre-disaster mitigation grant assistance and increased federal funding after a disaster. Uh, following Hurricane Katrina in late 2005, the California State Legislature passed AB 2140, which is known as the California Disaster Assistance Act, which became effective January 1st of 2007. Compliance with this assembly bill is optional, but non-compliance limits the city's ability to obtain additional state funding for certain disaster recovery projects. This is the way the, uh, this is the way um, this works, and uh, w this is the way it works when uh, federal officials declare a disaster area. The federal government pays 75% of the disaster costs, and the rest of the costs are shared by the state and the city. The city pays 6.25% uh, and the state pays 18.75%. However, if we adopt the local hazard mitigation plan as a part of our safety element of our general plan, the state will pay 100% of the costs of the non-federal share for uh, 11 specified federally declared disasters. Uh, it also opens up the door for the city to apply for pre-disaster mitigation funds for uh, hazard mitigation planning, and these grants are available on an annual basis. The pre-disaster grant program was set in place to reduce the overall risk to people and structures while at the same time also reducing reliance on federal funding if an actual disaster were to occur. Uh, your planning staff began preparing this local hazard mitigation plan in the fall of 2011. We attended several meetings with the Operational Area Planning uh, Committee, which was a group consisting of representatives from various federal, state, and local jurisdictions, uh, special districts, including school districts, nonprofit organizations, businesses, various tribes in the uh, valley, and the public. The plan was crafted in close cooperation with Riverside County and represents a unified and coordinated effort for all cities within the county in the event of disaster. By law, this hazard mitigation plan must describe the type, location, and extent of all natural hazards that can affect the city, describe the city's vulnerability to these hazards, include a mitigation strategy that provides the city's blueprint for reducing potential losses, and contain a plan that, uh, a maintenance process. Uh, our plan, for example, identifies public buildings, public buildings and valuations, uh, maps vulnerable areas due to various natural hazards, such as earthquakes, li liquefaction, uh, uh, flooding, uh, it identifies at-risk structures, structures with the potential for large gatherings such as convention halls and theaters, and lists senior assisted living projects where additional ad assistance or resources may be required in the event of a disaster. Our plan also discusses our annual quake preparedness outreach, and an example mitigation measure is the Frank Sinatra All-Weather Bridge Replacement Project currently going through planning and environmental review. In December of 2011, we submitted our draft plan to Riverside County Fire Office of Emergency Services um, since they were lead agency in this multi-jurisdictional plan. And in June 2012, the county forwarded our plan to the California Emergency Management Agency and also FEMA for review and approval. Uh, staff was contacted for additional information in August 2012, which is why the, um, our annex is dated August 2012 on the right-hand side of the screen. And 20 months later, in August of this year, the city was notified that the plan was finally approved by FEMA. So this project has been in the works uh, for about three years now, and I'm very happy to bring it to you this afternoon. Uh, the city has one year to adopt this plan and provide a certified copy of the resolution of adoption to FEMA, demonstrating that the, uh, the project has been approved and incorporated into the safety element of the general plan. 
Uh, this uh, proposed general plan amendment represents a planning study and we recommend that you uh, find that a categorical exemption is acceptable under CEQA. The Planning Commission did review this information and considered the staff report held a public hearing on August 14th and unanimously recommended approval of the categorical exemption and the local hazard mitigation plan uh, to the City Council and staff would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, bud. Any questions from Council? Okay. <laughs> You did a great job on the plan. Um, how often do you have to renew that? Well, uh, I, it's my understanding that the last time we did this was in the early 2000s. I'm hoping that we don't have to do it for a while. Because <laughs> it, takes, it takes three years to get through the process. I think it's a five-year plan, actually. So uh, I, uh, I don't think that we're going to have to do it for a while. I will let you know. We did this in-house, by the way, uh, without the use of consultants. Good job. Very nice. Bud did a great job on this. He has been working with the county and FEMA for three years. The most important thing is that adoption of this allows the city to be eligible for full state and federal reimbursement in the event of an emergency mm -hmm. uh, and a disaster or catastrophe. It also allows us to um, apply for pre-emergency grants mm -hmm. so we can uh, in upgrade the infrastructure of the city. Thank you, Randy. No other questions? Any questions from the audience? Okay, public hearing closed. Uh, will someone like to make a motion? Or, okay. Let me, let, let Chuck do it. I hereby suggest, propose that you move. the- Move. That the uh, city council approve of an exemption from the California Environmental Quality Act 15308 for EA 110007 and to adopt a resolution for general plan amendment, case number GPT 11002, appending a local hazard mitigation plan to the city's general plan. Okay, and I will second that. Please vote. <laughs> Motion carries 5 0. Thank you so much. Right. And we will move on now to uh, Steve, and he'll give us a. Uh, sure. A Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, the City Council at this point is going to recess in a closed session to consider one anticipated litigation item pursuant to Government Code Section 54956.9 along with a pending case known as Brian Harrison versus City of Rancho Mirage. And the council will also meet with its real property negotiator regarding property located, identified as APM 684-240-001. Okay. Thank you so much and thank you all for attending. We'll see you next time and have a, a lovely evening. Thanks. Meeting now adjourned.